Oh, I am giggling because people in the Discord, oh, you know, you know where we are. We're live. This is This Week in Science, and it is time for our live weekly, but we haven't really been doing it weekly because of weather and power outages and babies and life. Uh, we try. We really do try. Uh, but yeah, our live weekly show that we try to do Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we make mistakes, if there are more power outages and internet outages and ice apocalypses in the middle of the show, you know, we those will get edited out and you'll never know. It'll be great. And, uh, you know, but you're watching live, so you'll see all that happen. People in the podcasts, they'll never know. I just want you to know that. Uh, so right now, click the likes, the subscribes, the shares. Let's make it happen uh, for getting ourselves into the algorithms, however that works out. And in the meantime, you're here with us and we're so happy that you are. So let's do this show. You ready? Let's do it. All right, we're going to do this. Okay, starting the show in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number... 957, recorded on Wednesday, January 24th, 2024. <laughs> How is it that date already? I don't know. Filling in the gaps with science. Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your heads with vegetarians, HIV, and old fossils. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Science is a method of discovery. It is a practice that, above all else, requires high standards of ethics, honesty, and dedication to unbiased truth. When science is published, the observations of a few become the observations of the many, replicating and reproducing like a living organism. The documentation of research makes up the body of human knowledge. That is why it is with great sadness that I have to inform you of the death of science. Not, right. not that all science is dead, far from it, but that science is not immortal, that it can suffer injury, disability, and yes, even death. Currently, the scientific body has an infection of industry-crafted research papers, a pathology of for-profit publishing, a disease of career-dependent publication, presenting with symptoms of passive peer review, organized infiltration of editing boards, plagiarism, bribery, and outright fraud. The disease has become so advanced that the typical treatment methods of retractions are unable to achieve significant curative results. Damage done to science by unethical publishing standards is life-threatening, not just in terms of lost time in efforts to replicate the unreplicatable results, but in human lives lost to derailment of the scientific process and to derailment of future progress in many fields to the living body of science itself, upon which the future of humanity relies. And most importantly, above all else, it threatens the integrity and standards expected each week by the listeners of This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge. And a good science to you, too, Justin. No, Blair. She's not here this week. She's got sickness and all sorts of stuff. And uh, hopefully we'll get her back soon. <sighs> but all of you are here. So welcome. Thank you for joining us, everyone out there. It's so wonderful to see you. Um, Rachel, cut. <coughs> Identity 4, is this microphone better? Are we good? Justin. Let's, yeah. Let's 
Less echo. Yeah, less roomy. Yeah. I uh, had the wrong microphone on. Okay, and end cut. <laughs> Justin, it is so wonderful to see you this week after a week off. I was unable to keep the show going last week because of Portland's ice apocalypse. Uh, it was trees down. Hundreds, hundreds of trees down that nobody thought were going to fall. Like oh. big old Douglas firs and Walt, like <sighs> power, internet, all sorts of things were out and people froze and it was cold and it was awful. And, you know, <laughs> your whole opening about science and the death of science and the way things are going really struck me because I'm kind of been thinking since this last week took me back to like the 1870s before <laughs> power lines and before yeah. delivery uh, dinners um, and to a time when people was, were still searching for truth science was still defining itself as science it hadn't been you know systematized as or institutionalized as much as it uh, has been now. And we find the same things striking our culture everywhere. And when things break down, it's just people left. And that's the thing that makes everything. Yeah. And that's why it, you can't trust anything because it's people. No, oh, no, wait, what I'm, different take? This, okay. no, what I'm saying is that if people work together and come together as communities, that we can solve problems. And in Portland, and I know across the country, United States, I'm, I am being North America centric here. Mm -hmm. um, people came together to try and help people volunteering at warming shelters, uh, helping their neighbors to find heat, to have blankets, to do, you know, these are little things, but it's also the, in science. If people come together and work together to create the environment where scientists can ask questions, like all, like diverse groups of people can ask questions and there are resources available and there are fewer gatekeepers and roadblocks, mm. then science can flourish and foster a, a, a much better society. And that's exactly how I felt for a long time. But I now think, And now. <laughs> well, I really, like, I think there's something to the job of a good gatekeeper that's uh, yeah. missed when you get rid of them. And I think that's part of the problem in, in scientific publishing right now is that the gatekeepers kind of... Uh, disappeared with the expansion of publications with the open access journals, which on the first hand sounds like open access. Yeah. You don't need a subscription to see this, to access this. This is great. It opens it up to the public, but what it also turned into was a lack of gatekeeping and a, an easy way to charge money for a publication <laughs> with a scientific name that was getting on the list of accreditations. Okay. So uh, we can talk about open science impact. in this way, but what, or open publishing, because that's yeah. different from open science. Open science is the practice of uh, making data available and open mm -hmm. and making methodologies open and available to as many people as possible. So like NASA making its data sets available uh, for anybody to be able to yeah. access and crunch numbers. Um, open publishing is the practice of actually opening journals so that there's no paywall. So that, you know, you don't have to pay a subscription fee. You can just... Mm -hmm read them. And uh, there is the regulation now in the United States that anything that has been funded by NIH or the NSF or the U.S. government generally, after six months, it has to be open to anybody to be able to read. Uh, but it they still allow the publishers to have that paywall to make money for just a little bit of time. But now yep. you're saying that the gatekeeping, now, now you're using gate, gatekeeping. And I've worked with people who have been part of opening publishing and having journals that are open to begin with, where mm -hmm. that's the way it is. There, there is still peer review. There is still quality assurance. There is still, I, yes, I see your face. 
Oh no, no, no my face. face. I, my <laughs> face isn't saying <laughs> anything. No words came out. All right, for everybody who's like listened to the podcast forever and has never watched the show on video, like Justin tells a story with his face all the time. Like I know where he's going before he goes there. <laughs> I can't help um, it. My face is is open access publishing. Uh, it is. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. So, but this has been taken advantage of, and there are what we call predatory journals that take money from researchers, from people who want to publish, whatever, and they they don't do peer review. They publish AI written articles. They publish fake articles, like gibberish. Um, there are these predatory journals that if that people have taken time to start mm -hmm. identifying and basically, okay, say, this is bad. This article's bad. This journal's bad. These are the ones you don't want to, you can't trust them, right? And so I think that is more so the issue here. There is still peer review. There's, I mean, we have preprint archives and that's not peer reviewed and that's work. The idea behind that was to get work out so that before it's published, scientists can get help from other scientists in making their work better so that they can, might have a better chance of getting published. Mm. You know, you put it out there and you go, but, but the media got a hold of it and it became, you know, and it's be, like preprints have become something that is accepted as accepted. Right. Um, right. Hang on, hang I don't on. know. We're so I'd love to, I would love to hear more of what you have to say on this. So I'm going to start, I have this, uh, this rant that I was saving for the end of the, but I'll go ahead and do it. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, move the bit all the way up to the top. And okay. Then, no, uh, no. Okay. So, cause it's going to, what we're doing, it's going to broach a couple of these subjects and I got some pushback because no, but what we is, can say this is how it's being framed. And I think the problem is bigger. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're teasing everybody because we're going to talk about this later in the show and we're going to save it. So if you want to hear more about what Justin thinks about this issue, you got to keep listening because we have a whole show ahead and we have all sorts of stories to talk about. Um, I have RNA where we don't really expect it, but we found it. And what the, what it's do? What's it doing there? Um, I also have HIV secrets, penguin poop, and some old fossils. What do you have, Justin? Mm. Aside I've from got, rant, I've got following uh, a fourteen thousand year old uh, mammoth around. It's going to be kind of fun. Oh, uh, the paleo diet that may have been uh, mostly vegetarian. And the world's first successful embryo, embryo transfer in rhinos is making it so that the last two surviving uh, southern white rhinos, both female, uh, will have offspring. Wow. What? What? Really impossible. And All then, right. yes, uh, I'll go uh, deeper into why uh, the problem with science is, <laughs> is not limited to the idea of predatory publishing any longer. No, I can't wait to dig into it because, I mean, the problem with science isn't just a problem with science. Science is society and culture. And so it goes deeper. It goes way deeper. I can't wait to get into it. Um, but let's do some stories first. So... Uh, as we jump into the show here, I have to remind you that if you are just tuning in, this is This Week in Science. If you are not yet subscribed to us, we broadcast, stream live every week, Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Pacific time, and whatever time it is where Justin is, um, on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. We're on the social medias, mostly as at Twist Science, and you can find our website where there are show notes and links to a lot of the stories that we talk about at twist.org. All right, time for the science stories. Let's talk about RNA. Okay. We've been talking about RNA for a very long time. RNA is not DNA. Uh, <laughs> ribonucleic acid. What is ribonucleic acid? Ribonucleic acid. Uh, some people hypothesize predated DNA and uh, maybe 
after chemical processes came to light, ended up making DNA happen and, and maybe RNA was responsible for a lot of the processes that led to life on our planet. But anyway, RNA, mostly when you learn about it in biology, is the messenger RNA that takes information from the DNA in the nucleus, a gene that's been translated from DNA to RNA. It takes it and it goes, and it shuttles it outside of the nucleus of a cell into the cell body. So like the nucleus is in the middle, the DNA is in there, it gets translated, RNA goes, I gotta go do something, and it leaves, and it's the traveling part of information, and then it goes, oh yeah, let's make something, and it finds the ribosomes, and the messenger RNA gets turned into amino acids, base pairs, and the gene, not the genes, the proteins, the enzymes, the things that make things happen within our cells and within our body. We've been finding out, though, over the last several years that there are many different kinds of RNA. There's not just messenger RNA. There is like I, all sorts. There's all sorts. And they've been learning about these little balls of like cell stuff, they get spit out of cells that like take a little bit of the membrane with, they're called exosomes, but they get spit out. And usually they contain a lot of little pieces of RNA. And people are like, what are they doing out there? And there's some hypotheses that suggest that these little exosomes of RNA and uh, little, little bits of instructions might actually influence uh, uh, like reproduction, that they might travel along with the sperm and influence wow. how reproduction takes place and how genes come together and how they how they turn into the information that becomes an embryo. But that's not all. Uh, this new study out of Yale published in the journal Cell this last week uh, has been looking at what they call RNA... Uh, and cell surface RNAs on neutrophil recruitment. Have you heard of neutrophils before, Justin? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Neutrophils are involved in the immune response from in mammalian systems. And neutrophils are recruited when there's an infection, when you have a cut. Like, neutrophils, they go there to fight off bacteria and, you know, save you. Um, but part of the neutrophil action is that they need to have something on their surfaces that helps them recognize where they're going and what they're attacking and what they're doing. And they just discovered that there are little RNAs that are held on to the outside of these neutrophils. They're called glyco-RNAs. So sugars, glycogen, they hold these little tiny bits of RNA onto the surface of the neutrophil, and without them, the neutrophils just pass right on by. They don't even look at the thing that they were supposed to go attack. Interesting. Oh. Yeah. So if they get rid of those cell surface RNAs, Neutrophils don't work. They're impaired. Inflammation, like the, the neutrophils don't do what they're supposed to do uh, to help with uh, with fixing the endothelium. But now they know that these neutrophils, based on this particular study, are uh, involved in, uh, they have the, what they're called P-glycans or P-selectins. And these P-selectins help the RNAs and the neutrophils affect everything. And maybe this is a way that we can start targeting better uh, inflammatory responses or actually helping to control, out of control, inflammatory responses by understanding this little mechanism on the outside of one of the cells that's involved in inflammation in our bodies. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, 
I I just think it's so interesting this whole idea of RNA. We used to just be like, oh yeah, it just takes information from the nucleus and that's what it does. But now it's like it's everywhere. Yeah, that is wow. So this is completely like they just had no idea. This was how this was like the the GPS basically for the neutrophils is coming all the way from the nucleus. Yes. Uh, and so these these researchers, uh, they really were just like, what's going on? Why are RNAs on the surface of cells? What's happening? They shouldn't be there. And so they followed it followed it to the source and now they realize that the RNA is really like it's like uh the hound dog or the you know the mm -hmm. <laughs> the bomb sniffing or drug sniffing dogs at the at the airport they help those white blood cells the neutrophils actually go find where they need to go yeah it's a, and it's the question is it uh is this instruction to the nucleus saying we need this or is this uh, are or are these ah, uh, sort of tags uh, that are uh, going along looking for a specific thing and then happening to run into it? Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's one of the interesting thing. Uh, they're different from RNA that's found inside the cell body, mm -hmm. but they have been migrated, they've been taken out of the inside of the cell. So somehow there's a process that, that they don't understand yet in which the RNA binds with the glycogen and becomes this component that allows it to be a first responder. And it's essential to, uh, to, fighting, to fighting disease. Mm -hmm. More to learn. Why sugar? Why RNA? Where? What? What's going on? But now we know, and it. This is exciting and new. Exciting and new. Hmm. Tell me a story. Well, once upon a time in Alaska, there were people, and these people lived in different places, and at around the same time. There were woolly mammoths running around yes. while there were people in Alaska. I saw Ice Age. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah so researchers, they, what they basically did is they got a hold of a woolly mammoth tusk and were able to do get isotopic data along with DNA from other mammoths at the, at the site and archaeological evidence that indicates where this mammoth it was traveling sort of they could tell uh they could tell it was like living over in this area eating this stuff and drink from these waters over there over a 20-year lifespan of a of an of a healthy female woolly mammoth wait 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 so, so wait 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 they're able to identify where the mammoth went based on isotopic evidence in the of like yeah, stuff, and so they, the stuff they that they ate, and it's like, oh, well, that would be over there, and that would be over there. It's, stuff they what? ate and water they drank from. So, what? The, this is also something that we've done in uh, in humans for a yeah. long time, where we have been able to tell, like, oh, what was were the longobeards of Italy? We can tell that the the longobeards people, who were this mysterious group of mercenaries that suddenly showed up in northern Italy, and they were there for like a long time. Uh, and had a different culture from, uh, had replaced sort of a, a culture that was there in their area and had these traditions that were partly integrated uh, to the Roman uh, ways, but also had these sort of more Germanic traditions as well, and in mm -hmm. Hungarian, like Eastern European as well. And by, by doing the same sort of technique, they could tell, oh, this group uh, actually was born in germany or this one may have been scandinavian or this one was from the from more to the east of based on isotopic evidence within the bone okay, that preserves how it was built right okay so they did this to this mammoth and they also then noticed that this mammoth used to visit all of the known uh, habitats of humans 
all the the hunting villages and all the places where humans gathered 14,000 years ago. And so then they realized, hey, wait a second. This woolly mammoth probably isn't visiting the humans. What's probably going on is this these early humans have all decided to place their camps where the woolly mammoths go for water, where they go and graze and where they so that it kind of shows likely. yeah. Yeah. It kind of uh, more shows something about uh, humans and their uh, hunter gather relationship with the migration of mammoths. Although uh, there is uh, there is some some line in here about this being, you know, the the early you know, earliest uh, humans uh, into the Americas were although 14,000 years is a long time ago. <clears throat> uh, there's sites much older elsewhere in the Americas. So it depends on like, if there's another, you want to add another 10,000 years to that. Yeah. Call this the early, like we're still talking about, there's no current modern Europeans in Europe. There's no, there's no uh, pyramids built anywhere. And you're right. still going to have 10,000 years before any, or 5,000 years before any of that's even taking place. But we're fine. But okay, so if we're talking about 14,000 years ago, this was like mm -hmm. the original idea of when humans 13,000, 14,000 years ago, that was the original evidence, right? That people yeah, used well, to think, oh, oh no, humans no, in North America, 13, no, 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 no. But then they found footprints and they found other stuff. And like, well, the original is depends and, on where you want the original. The original was about yeah. six or 7,000 years. And then, yeah. then they discovered Clovis culture. They found right. all these artifacts and they finally dated them to about 13,500 years. So that, that was the revolutionary change. And there was that guy, uh, Jean-Marc, uh, Jean-Mars, ah, what's his name, in Canada, who's like, I got uh, signs of human evidence, 20,000 years old. In a and nobody in listened to him. Nobody <laughs> paid any attention to him. And then, yes, now they've got footprints in New Mexico, potential cave sites in South America that are 20, maybe 30,000 years old. So I'm thinking about the Clovis culture uh information and kind of like where we were uh a while back thinking about that and yeah. it aligns really nicely with this and also with a timeline of humans as nomadic hunter gatherers and this isn't just a one time thing probably this is something that evolved over hundreds thousands of years where cultures would migrate and follow the animals and go where the different animals went. And so, I don't know, I kind of see this not just as evidence that, like they're saying, humans probably were following mammoths, but um, I see it kind of as evidence that this probably was something that was well-established. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so, and this is kind that's of interesting. Uh, that's me. Because this is... This is sort of before the fall of Clovis culture, mm -hmm. right? This is while, when the big game was still here. This is, would be before the Younger Dryas event. So mm -hmm. it, it shows that there was a, a quite a bit of human activity that far back. But yeah, so you were... Uh, before they, said, they killed the, all the mammoths, right? Yeah, no. or, or they died out due to the Younger Dryas uh, yeah, events, yeah. climate yeah. change. Uh, but the mammoth tusk says here are well suited to isotopic study because they grow throughout the ancient animal's life uh, with clearly visible layers appearing when split lengthwise. So sort of like bands in a tree, right? Tree yeah. bands. The growth bands give researchers a way to collect chronological record of a mammoth's life by studying isotopes in those layers along the tusk. So then you can kind of move slowly back seasonally through time as as these layers are laid down and tell what, you know, the the chemistry of the water they were drinking from or the food that they were eating. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. I love it. Like they've been trying to do stuff like that with, the you know, the DNA preserved in teeth of humans, uh, dentin, other old 
fossilized stratified structures but yeah this is a i love this this is a yay yeah. yay and, and troubleshooting scientists cool. i love it's it it's cool that it, it does it throughout the life like uh human teeth stop right so mm -hmm. whenever they're doing that like i was mentioning the study in the lung bodies and whatever what have you that they, they're telling the story of when where they grew up Right, they can tell where this, uh, where the individual was a child, what region they may have uh, been a child in, but mm -hmm. they can't tell anything uh, beyond that because once the human teeth are developed, they stop collecting that information. Right. Our health, our hair works. Other, yeah, there's other tissues, but yeah, this is great. Kevin Reardon points out most of the evidence for when humans showed up are underwater now. Yeah. And that's a lot. That's, uh, and it's going to get is, worse. <laughs> it's going to get worse. <laughs> well, but that's the thing because humans yeah. are so coastal. We have this huge relationship mm -hmm. with, with coastal waters. And that's been true throughout human history to the point where, yeah, there's, they've, uh, somewhere between Denmark and, and the Northern islands of the UK. It, it's it's a little bit shallow that a portion of I guess the North Sea, and for a lot of history, sort of ancient -y time history, it would have been open. It would have, it would have not been covered in in seawater, right? So mm -hmm. so they have found evidence. I think there were like I don't know harvesting seaweed or something along the bottom, whatever they do out there, uh, and and brought up spear points of some kind right like artifacts from likely neanderthals that would have been yeah. roaming the area so yeah there's a lot of uh, human history that is going to be underwater because sea levels are higher than they they once were and this is why we need researchers who can snorkel or drive submarines or build uh underwater autonomous vehicles yeah yeah. Marine archaeology. Yes. That's what we need. Uh, moving on from mammoths, we're going to go to HIV. It's not a really clean segue at all. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it does follow the uh, through line of scientists figuring out new ways to investigate ongoing questions and problems. Researchers just published in Nature their open access article, The HIV Capsid Mimics Karyoferrin Engagement of FG Nuclear Porins. Nucleoporins. What does that mean? Okay, researchers know that HIV, the human, human immunodeficiency virus, infects non-dividing cells. It gets through the cell membrane and then it gets into the nucleus and it has to get into the nucleus of the cell in order to get reproduced. How does it get into the nucleus? That has been a question that researchers have been trying to figure out for a very long time. HIV is large. The capsid, which is the viral coat that encases all of the viral uh, information, is more than a thousand times larger than what is supposed to be able to get through pores in the nucleus, hmm. in the nuclear membrane. So like membranes, they're these, you know, these lipid bilayers. And normally they keep stuff out, but if stuff pushes hard enough, it might be able to get in. Sometimes there are pores and the pores are uh, molecular constructions, components that can grab onto things inside or outside of the membrane and help them through. And when it comes to these nuclear pores, these channels that they have in the membrane, there are what are what are called chaperones. And usually the chaperones go, "Hey, I know you. Come on in." And they grab onto whatever protein it is and they pull it through or they help it through the membrane. In these uh, FG, which are otherwise known as nuclear or uh, disorder, intrinsically disordered nucleoporin domains enriched in phenylalanine glycine, 
which is FG, somehow, dipeptides. Um, the chaperones are called karyoferins. And what they do is they bind a cargo and they allow it to come through the FG dipeptides and into the nucleus. What they found is that HIV has evolved to mimic the karyoferins. So it, even though it's too big, it has its own chaperone. It, it's like a kid with a fake ID and <laughs> <laughs> showing it and, 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 and the, the bouncer is like, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, of course. You fit right in. Come on in. And so this is a really interesting, I mean, Blair talks a lot about mimicry in the am, animal corner and in biology, generally in larger organisms when we're talking about predator prey interactions. But I think this is just fascinating because this is an example of mimicry at the, the molecular level. This is how like the real battles are taking place, right? Yeah. HIV is a virus and it's figured out the key. It's like, oh, I need, I need a chaperone. I'll make my own. Oh, I, I got some. It, it looks like a chaperone. I'll get in. Huh. Um, so not only is this very, very important for understanding how HIV and other retroviruses make their way into the nucleus of cells, uh, it can also really help us understand how to chemically breach the nuclear membrane in case we need to get drugs into it, in case we need to use it therapeutically. This is something that we might be able to take advantage of ourselves when we are designing medications that can help people. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, so then I'm also like immediately like, ah, I wonder when this, I wonder when this sort of, like you say, this arm, molecular arms race took place. Because it, it likely, likely didn't take place in humans. Right? Right. Likely this happened no. long, long before ago. humans were encountering uh, HIV in any kind of uh, pandemic type scale. Yeah. Well, we know, well, the idea is that uh, humans were hunting bushmeat and then that was what uh, exposed us to primates that had, uh, from whatever they'd been exposed to, uh, been infected with the virus. So this is probably a very long chain of um, animal hosts that led yeah. to humans, you know decades ago but i don't i don't know i mean that's the story i remember and if i am wrong i hope somebody uh corrects me because i don't want to share incorrect information yeah well whether that's whether it's the correct story. information or not that's the that's the uh, the old story uh, at least right so yeah. so but then that, I, you know, it's 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 sort of like uh, the molecular arms race, but it could also just all have been an accident, right? Of of a of a host that didn't have a negative or interaction with HIV in yeah. some way. That this was its method of utilizing. Ah, yeah. It's, well, uh, I mean that. I mean that's how a lot of things happen. Is that there is what we what we call a reservoir, right? There is a species that isn't affected by the virus, but. Yeah. They hold it. They and hold it, it, and then it can, uh, and it finds all these interesting adaptions and ways to to yeah. survive in this host that isn't rejecting. Yes, uh, and, and it does. It, it doesn't hurt killing. the host. It doesn't yeah. help the host necessarily. And but then, when the host comes close to something else that uh, that's configured that a can, little different. Yeah. yeah. I have to say, just sidebar tangent, um, I went on a rabbit hole when I had COVID <laughs> over the holidays. I started looking into cell membranes and how things are transported through pores. And I took physiology. I was a graduate student. I did grad level like physiology, electrophysiology. I thought I knew how things worked. And I have to say, when you really start digging, there's a lot 
that doesn't actually make sense. <laughs> Just going to say it right now. There are these structures, the channels, the pores that are kind of, you know, the gatekeepers. They have a uh, charged interior. So if it's negatively charged, then positively charged molecules might be able to make it through. Some of them need a, a chaperone that guides them through that, um, you know, that'll hold them and make it safe for them to come through. But there is a whole series of different conformations and different ways that molecules that you wouldn't think should go through uh, these pores and into cells through the memory that somehow they do. And it's a huge, I, I got lost somewhere because it stopped making sense. And at a certain point, it was like the pressure pushes hard and the things go in. <laughs> and I was like, oh, pressure gradients. Oh my God, that's just the end of story. But, <laughs> but then there's also, but then there's also these the little cells try tubes, to do what they can. Yeah. These what? These little tubular things that <laughs> form on the outside of cells that reach out and explore their environment and then send uh, mRNA down, down the tubes to go into other cells yeah. that don't have them. Or like it's, there is, is really weird. Like, you know, so how about much. life finds a way? It is, gets really strange the, the, the more detail you, you collect on <laughs> we just how a know. cell exists. We don't know enough yet, everybody, but I uh, I find this very interesting. So anyway, moving on from HIV and how it gets into the cells, let's talk about hunter-gatherers. Uh, this story is just uh, uh, from the... This is South America. This is down in the... Is it the Andean... Uh, what is it? Plateau the, or the mountain region stuff? Yeah. I don't know. Where is the <laughs> Andes? That sounds like it. I only think of the mountains, yeah. but this is uh, early humans in the Andes spanning 9,000 to 6,500 years ago. Okay, and by an, doing analysis of, of ancient human remains, they were able to find again isotopic composition of human bones to show the plants uh, the and the foods and the that and meats whatever that made up the majority of the individual diets they found 80 percent of the diet was plant matter with just 20 percent being from meat sources S uh, suggesting that these hunter gatherers were likely doing a lot more gathering than hunting it's also interesting is that they they found uh, that the these early Andean people were eating a lot of potatoes, which were developed there by farming. They were poisonous. No, oh, they weren't poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> potatoes were poisonous. I mean that is that. Wait, what? Yes, historically potatoes were poisonous. It's thanks to humans and uh, their cultivation of potatoes oh. that potatoes have become less poisonous. I so I didn't know that. I knew mm -hmm. something like you're not supposed to eat the the leaves of, of potato, and people mm -hmm. who tried that got sick. Mm -hmm. uh, like when they brought potatoes back to Europe, people were eating the wrong part <laughs> of the. They were, eating some leafy shoots or something from the plant and got sick when it turned out, oh, it's not the part you eat. Don't do that. Just do Don't it eat wrong. the green stuff. But, uh, yeah, so it kind of suggests, though, that maybe some of the, maybe some farming and cultivation was taking place uh, even earlier than the earlier uh, creation of, of these things in, in the Americas. But anyway, yeah, the idea of hunter gatherers is going around hunting game all the time. Maybe not so yeah. much. Yeah, maybe not so much. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was, maybe, you know, <laughs> farming wasn't actually that big of a leap for humans. Cause you can kind of picture, all right, you're doing a little bit of the nomadic thing, right? Well, we're going to go, but you're chasing not game. You're chasing plants. You know, the potatoes grow in this season over here, so you go over there. And, yeah, you might kill a couple of animals that are there to eat that happen to be there also. 
and you go, oh, winter's coming. We got to go over to this place where we uh, where we know this other tuber underground is going to be. We can eat that because it's still these berries that grow in the winter, whatever it is. And then what do humans do like every animal does? They have, they tend to uh, uh, poop. And they have trash middens. They have places where they put their garbage. And they tend to do these things in the same areas. And some of those things that they poop out are seeds that have been digested. And then they germinate. And they grow. And, they grow. and then somebody notices, hey, did you notice that every time we leave this, uh, this camp and we go to the other camp, we throw out uh, our old potatoes that we took along with us because they went bad. Then we get a, t a potato patch in that spot next year. And then it kind of just evolves from there. People making observations. And then, but it sounds like, I don't know when we think this revolution of farming took place uh, elsewhere in the world, but it sounds like it may have already been in place in the Americas somewhere in the neighborhood of 9,000 years ago. Yeah. I mean, from what I've heard, I think uh, the oldest agricultural evidence is maybe 10,000. So it's right about the same time ish. I mean, give or take. Fascinating. People, we've been doing stuff a long time. You got to pay attention to it. Also, your paleo diet is mostly vegetables. Uh, Congratulations so on eating the wrong thing again in a fad diet. I think you reported on something like this a long time ago where uh, it was like more grains or something from there was yeah, some other evidence like in Europe in Europe they in were Europe, finding yeah. that the, yeah that the people ate quite a bit of grass and grain and you know meat was a, uh, also a su uh, supplemental mm -hmm. but uh, so this is like more yeah. evidence similarly but on another continent <laughs> If you if, if we actually mm -hmm. had the omnipotent light of of all knowing science at our fingertips, I think you could basically take every book on nutrition off uh, off the shelves. Like it can all come down. I don't know about all of them, but yeah. all anything that has to do with diet and nutrition that's not <laughs> a negative, right? <laughs> the, if we put the warning labels. <laughs> On the ultra processed food for the things that we know, the diseases that we know are caused by these ultra processed foods, mm -hmm. we can we could we could do that labeling. But all of the health benefit stuff for diet, a lot of that can come off the labels. You don't know what's it's not that food is healthy, it's just food. It's yeah. just food is just food, but it can be unhealthy food. And I think that's yes. the difference. <laughs> yes. No, I, I think you're ex you're exactly right. Uh, the uh, val the psychological valuation of certain foods over others is actually uh, we're doing ourselves a disservice. But it is good to know the kinds of food that are available to us and their nutritional value, but not give them uh, like Super value power. judge. Like yeah. Moral judgment, whatever. This is food. Eat what you want. Uh, my final story for this little first part of the show, <laughs> which took an hour, uh, is that researchers have determined a molecular switch that determines whether or not uh, osteocytes, osteoblasts, which are bone forming cells, become bone forming cells or whether they turn into adipocytes, fat storing cells. Uh, researchers, they're at New York University. They looked at skeletal stem and progenitor cells. These are cells in the bone marrow and they go on to help with bone development and repair and all. And they tend to to go into more fat storing and less bone forming as you get older. Mm -hmm. And so something happens as you age that creates an environment that tells these stem cells to be like, yeah, yeah, we got you got bones. That's okay. You need fat. Have some more fat. Uh, and when that happens, you become 
more likely to have a fracture. You, This is probably part of osteoporosis uh, and other issues as people age. They looked at the molecular mechanisms in mice and they were able to look at the gene expression, <gasps> single cell RNA sequencing, what? Uh, in skeletal tissue. And they found that there are specific signaling molecules that are in uh, involved in this switch. And there is a group of them. It's what they're called notch signaling genes. And so as you get older and you have bone degeneration, there's more notch signaling gene activity. And so they think this is what's active. And they were able to uh, like switch this around in the mice and change the notch activity. And what they say is that they basically showed that uh, they were able to change the phenotype, which is the how, how things worked in the mouse, not the genotype, but how everything uh, came out um, in such a way that they changed the mineralization and they were able to uh, create more mineral for stronger bones in uh, the mice that they were able to downregulate the notch signaling. So if they got rid of it as the as the mouse the, the mouses the mice aged, then uh, the mice had stronger, more mineral rich bones. And so this could be a target for helping people have stronger, healthier bones as they age. That said, this is not a replacement for doing the things and eating the foods that keep your bones healthy in the first place and make sure that you're aging healthily. But if you do have a condition that is leading to uh, bone mineral degeneration, this, I mean, who knows? It could be on... Uh, <laughs> Probably available for you kids, but <laughs> right now available for mice. They're fixing fixing mouse bones. Yeah, mice are gonna get all the good treatment going forward. They always like, do. Well, this is this is good news because of all of the the goals that we set for aging. Uh, usually, we start with I want my appearance to be good. I want my mind to be healthy. And so here you are, you've, you've directed uh, scientific medical progress so that at age 150, your skin looks great, your <laughs> mind functions perfectly well. And then your, your hip bones breaks. are brittle as, <laughs> <laughs> as a sugar cookie. Like, uh, oh no, we should have started with the foundation, the skeletal structure of the human before we worried about the other things. So this is good. This is another step into humans living forever. Yeah. And, and, you know, notch signaling genes are involved in a lot of different things within, uh, within the body. So this isn't just to be taken lightly and you can't just be like, ah, get rid of notch. That, that isn't necessarily what you want to do, but if it's, uh, approached in the right way, uh, maybe it's a therapeutic target or, you know, I don't know, you were talking about diet earlier, and there has been evidence also that uh, weightlifting or, you know, lifting uh, stuff that isn't just your body weight can help strengthen your bones because it's giving your bones a struggle. Uh, people who are able to walk longer distances are less, like, less likely to have brittle bones. Um, you know, all this evidence is to say, you know, there's something involved in how metabolism works and what ends up creating the switch and leading to upregulation of notch genes versus, uh, yeah, youth blood. It, yeah, there's this whole, there's a whole, the bones are just a, like such an, uh, an amazing organ. But yeah, the more you use it, the more sort of wear and pressure, I guess, you put on your bones, the more they build. The, mm -hmm. the stronger they can become. And they're also, this is, you know, you talk about, oh, you got to eat right. Well, you know where most of your body's calcium comes from? 
your bones. Uh-huh. Your body uses your bones calcium. If you Unless have you it, eat lots it, of good right, food with like right, sunlight and vitamin D and all the things, and you have a balanced diet, and then you're then you're well, healthy. Well, it's, it's kind of a point that it's like you're you can yeah you can eat uh, uh, if you don't have a calcium in your diet. I suppose I should say uh, your body will still need it and use it from your bones. It will take it. It will take it away from your bones and use it elsewhere. Uh, I think and it uses it like might the liver might need it or something. Or it calcium it is important for muscle cell function, for nerve cell function, for liver cell function, for basically every <laughs> cellular function in the body. There is a calcium <laughs> gradient involved, and calcium is also involved in apoptosis, cell death. Um, calcium is. <sighs> Yeah. Essential. We need it. So, so drink your milk <laughs> and eat your cheese, folks. That's the nutritional. Oh, I want to eat more cheese. But, Can but I then, eat more you know, cheese? If, if you're having nutrition. Okay. So, anyway, but the, the snatch thing is it's always it's tricky nacho when you cheese. Find, it's, <laughs> it's always tricky when you find uh, a mechanism because then you're like, Oh, what happens if I, what happens if I make too much nacho cheese? Is that going to be bad for the bones? What if I don't make enough? What if I've turned it off too much? And oh, what if I turn it up too high? What? I, so we, we, it's one of those things where you can like any you can overdo it. Drugs. It's about finding getting it to balance uh, <laughs> in a in a in a good way. So now I got to study mm -hmm. what is this notch ratio in all the healthy young people. And does it look, what does it look like in the, in people who have bone problems? And is there a way that we can regulate to a degree where we're mimic, uh, turning one to look more like the other, if it has the benefit? And, yeah. I think you have just determined somebody's research, uh, trajectory. That's great. Yeah. I think it would yeah. be a good one. And you know, it's a good, uh, good source of also a good source of, uh, uh, of uh, research projects, clearing your mind for a quick break. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a very quick break, as Justin has just yeah. said, uh, before he tried to break his desk now that he's off of the, uh, the video. Thank you for joining us for another episode of our science discussion fun. We like to have a good time here. We like to talk about science. We like to enjoy uh, digging into things, questioning things, maybe learning a little bit of something new. And if you're enjoying this as well and you know somebody who likes learning and digging in and trying to figure out things around the world, maybe share the show with them. Let them know that Twist is a show that they should subscribe to. Like, you know, help them out when you're with them hanging out and they're looking at their phone and ignoring you and, you know, surfing the internet, looking for scientific information. Just be like, I know what you need. And then, you know, subscribe to Twist on their phone for them. I mean, that could work. Um, additionally, we do definitely love your support. If you are able to head over to twist.org, you can click on the Zazzle link where we have a link that goes to our store at Zazzle where we have. Blair's Animal Corners, Twist 2024 calendar. It's available right now if you need a calendar for the, re the year. And there are lots of other great products as well that help to support the show. And our Patreon link is also at twist.org where you can click the Patreon link, get over to Patreon and join our Patreon community and be a supporter at any level that you're able to. Um, $10 and more a month, we will say thank you by name at the end of the show. And there are lots of other fun things get, that get sent to you from Patreon, depending on the level of your support. But I just, you know, you being here and listening and being a part of uh, this whole group, you let us do what we do. So thank you very much for your support. And I will come back, but Justin's not back at his desk yet. Maybe he's he'll get there. I don't know. I hope you all are doing well and aren't too cold and have been able to get heat and power and whatever you needed <laughs> over the last several weeks in the Northern Hemisphere. It's been a little chilly in different places. So um, 
There you are. Justin's got a warm mug of something. All right, coming on back with a little bit more twist. Let's keep this show going. Dun, dun, dun. <sighs> Justin, you want to tell some stories? Well, uh, what have I still got left? Oh, the, I said the southern white rhino was down to two. It's the northern uh, white rhino, uh, okay. apparently. I had the story completely wrong. <laughs> Blair would have corrected you if she were here. Yes. Yeah. So so it's the it's the northern white rhino that's down to two. And this outfit called BioRescue has succeeded in achieving the world's first pregnancy of a rhinoceros after an embryo transfer. Their new technique and method uh, used a uh, rhino embryo from a collected egg cell and sperm that was transferred into a southern white rhino surrogate mother at a conservative uh, conservancy in Kenya. Now, what's wild about this is that they have, they don't have to do that sort of crossbreeding scenario where they're using a southern rhino to make uh, more northern rhinos because the northern rhino is down to the two females, a mother and daughter. However, they have, uh, they, they have sperm. They were somebody was smart enough to collect rhino sperm. Before oh, they saved the it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I was wondering. I was wondering if this was some kind of uh, gene transfer or like I don't know what, but okay. They, yeah, they stored uh, uh, sperm. They apparently have uh, living cells from twelve different northern white rhino individuals stored in liquid nitrogen. So they are they are now. They, uh, this pregnancy was induced, what was it, September of 2023, and they are confirming that they are seven day, days into the pregnancy. And I believe they have 13 other uh, tests, embryo transfers that they have performed. So there's, you know, uh, they have some decent now evidence that they can take this technique that they've been developing and apply it to the Northern white rhino. So this is really is a, a wildly international, wildly international, but this is, they've got the, the currently they have the stored li liquid nitrogen. Is it a minus 196 degrees Celsius is stored in Berlin and another uh, and and in Italy, so there's a couple of locations where they have the the, the banks. This is research that's taking place uh, in Kenya to do the proof of concept. So it's really like a lot of groups working together here at BioRescue, researchers who've dedicated themselves to conserving a species, uh, which is really amazing. And and this is where I would always like to take a moment. For anybody who has a preconception of what a rhino is, they are not fearsome beasts as, as they are often portrayed or thought of. They actually, in their day-to-day -day lives, act like really big puppies. They spend most of their time playing with each other. And when they sleep, they sleep all snuggled up next to each other. And they, they're just the sweetest creature. Rhinos are like little puppy dogs. They're they really just, are. Yeah. They're, they're uh, they Can frolic I... in the in the wild. They <laughs> they play. They and and you know it it kind of helps to be a big rhino who can get kind of fierce if they need to, that they probably don't have a whole lot of predators. Can I show a picture oh. of the embryo? Would that be yeah, appropriate yeah, that people might like to see that? Um, it's with the um, with the materials from the press release, and they have uh, the southern white rhino fetus from the successful embryo transfer, September twenty fourth, two thousand twenty four. Wait, what? Two thousand twenty four. What year is it? It's 23. That's a miss. <laughs> like, Wait a minute. Is this future uh, time travel? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The caption there has got the, uh, the, the uh, somebody has been writing the, 
the current date and remember that. Can I write the current yeah. date? Oh, it's not 2023. The, yeah. the text in the article that clarifies. Well, the little baby, baby rhino looks like a just it's a little baby. Pretty little baby. I wonder how much this kind of technology is going to work in the future, uh, whether sperm banks and storage will allow uh, more species that are becoming endangered to uh, have a chance of coming back. I mean, population bottleneck of two females and then stored sperm, I, it, like, I guess it's a question of how many males do they have sperm? Yeah, it doesn't. So it doesn't, but, but I don't still, know if they're. But I don't know if small. they're related. I don't know how related they are of those twelve. You know, and then right. if they're even, they might even be related to these females. You know, so it's depending mm -hmm. on what that makeup is is going to determine some genetic health going forward. But uh, hopefully, they they can move forward and do this responsible well. way. Uh, Adea Wilson is asking: Do do rhinos learn like puppies? Well, I, I haven't actually spent that much time in... Talk to Blair. Yeah, we got to talk to Blair about uh, <laughs> rhino intelligence and cognition <laughs> stuff. However, I will tell you that they they do... Uh, they are potty trainable. Mm -hmm. Rhinos, as a group, will all go to a, a, a the same location to poop. Uh, and they won't, they won't poop where they sleep, and they won't poop where they eat, and they will take a little walk, sometimes as a group, one sees, oh, you're going, I'll go with you. And they'll go oh, and then they'll Oh, it's turn like around girls and, going to the bathroom at a club. Yeah. And they'll go in, into the <laughs> same spot yeah. uh, uh, as a group. They've sort of, mm -hmm. I don't know how it's decided, but they all know this is where we're taking care of our uh, business and not over there, not over here, not over there, not in our play area. So, so they're, they're, they are at least to that degree, you know, uh, trainable within yeah. the group. I don't know if we can train a rhino. I don't know if anybody's tried. I'm sure. I think somebody's probably I mean, tried. Zoo, maybe zookeepers. Zookeepers would know. Zookeepers uh, do a certain amount of... of I don't know. What's, there, there's beeping and then Marshall goes, oh, my bad. I don't know what's <laughs> happening right now. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> Things are weird around here. We're not quite back to normal since the ice apocalypse. Uh, we just got our power, I think, fully back. Yesterday, they replaced the power coupling to the house. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I still I'm on a battery backup right now just in case mm. things go <laughs> crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. We've been camping in the basement for the last week and a half, wow. and there are, uh, I don't know, we've had little floods, and uh, we've got power cables all over the house, and we have a generator in the back, and like, I, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm still in recovery mode, I think, from, from living. Well, yeah. they, what was it? they always say Portland is the city of the 90s. But 1890s. Now we know it's <laughs> yeah, I moved up to the West Hills and I didn't quite the envision what, what, did you, what it really You're meant. In the I'm, rurals. I'm in the rurals. Exactly. I grew up in the rurals. It just was a reminder of what the rurals are really like. And actually, I have to say, I'm really glad that Marshall and I went to Burning Man for 10 years because we were like Boy Scouts and so prepared. Had it all. <laughs> we did. <laughs> had it all packed we had away. batteries. We had a generator. We had extra food. We had extra water. <laughs> like, we got it. <laughs> nice. I, but seriously, I was like, oh, man, Burning Man totally did it for us. Taught us how to survive. Tangent, though. You want to do a rant, but uh, we were talking about rhino poop, so I want to move on to penguin poop and then my last little story and then we can rant All does right, that sound sure. okay yeah. um yeah so uh we've talked before about uh <laughs> watching animals from space and the possibility of uh different satellites to allow us to visualize colonies of animals and specifically penguins in antarctica 
and a new study that is just out in Antarctic Science, which is a journal, has shown that by using the European Space Agency's Sentinel-2 satellite that has a spatial resolution of 10 meters per pixel, yeah, a little blurry, but it's fine, um, the researchers were able to identify more breeding sites of emperor penguins based on their poop on the ice. So the researchers were able to uh, identify this, uh, the colonies. They looked at a whole bunch of different spots around Antarctica using this satellite over the years. And several years back, I think Blair, one of us reported on this news that these researchers were, were doing this, but it had uh, less fine resolution back when they first started trying to do this. They were able to get... Uh, a smaller number of breeding aggregations and colonies. But at this point, they were able to identify at least four more emperor colonies. And it was uh, identified not just the penguins, but because of the darkness of the snow, because of where the penguins yeah. left their guano behind. Yeah. That's clever. Yeah, but this is also very exciting because this species of penguins and, uh, and other penguins are becoming more and more endangered, especially as climate change is reducing the amount of ice that's available at the, uh, at, at, on the coasts of Antarctica and other Southern continents. And uh, there's a lot of habitat that's disappearing that many species of animals, in this case, we're talking specifically about penguins, but that, that are just, it's just disappearing. And so the way that these animals use ice and live on it in order for their breeding to work successfully, um, that way a life might be going away. And so it's good for us to know where there are and how many breeding populations there are. But with this, it brings the number of breeding populations up in a, popul in a group of animals that is on the verge of getting on the endangered species list. So this is good news. Yay, yeah. looking at poop from space. Woohoo. <laughs> the penguins are really clever. Like that's they found a continent that didn't have anyone else on it. We're gonna use uh, this. Nobody's here can, except oh. you know, if we just it's Those gonna seals. be tough. It's gonna be tough going, but there won't be anyone else here. Perfect. Yeah. Um, oh, and additionally, I must specify that they also used for these four breeding sites the Sentinel-2 and Maxar Worldview-2 imagery to identify these things. Okay, uh, moving on from penguins, let's talk about some old fossils. There are lots of questions about when uh, multicellular life emerged on our planet. And we've got a lot of dates that go back, uh, you know, single celled life. There's possibly like 3.9 million years ago, like billion. May, billion. Yeah. There's some, you know, rock fossil evidence that is questionable. People are still debating it possibly as long as go along as long ago as 3.9 billion years ago, which would have been, you know, like half a billion years after the earth formed, which is but there's this, there's this big gap too, because we have that uh, pre Cambrian explosion thing where we got all these life forms. But but the the reason we have this huge gap before we see all this life is because we imagine that they were soft bodied life forms, and these don't lend themselves to fossilization very well. Except that many of them have metabolic processes that involve things like calcium that we were talking about earlier or other elements that mineralize over time. And if the mineralization of their metabolic processes is captured in that moment in time against a rock uh, it's or just the mud in the, the mud, of the ocean, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Then those minerals can potentially be a hallmark, a, a sign that something 
living was there. And because we understand certain chemical processes, you know, there are certain things that work in organic chemistry, certain things that don't. We know s certain uh, actual uh, processes that, that, that go from one form of energy to another one use of calcium or hydrogen or whatever it is and, you know, change it to another formation and that can be left over. We're using this evidence also to look for life on Mars and other planets. Um, so in the lab, researchers have shown that yeast can be multicellular. Uh, and so that was kind of interesting because, you know, they're like, ah, oh, yeast, we think of it as like a single celled organism, but, oh, it can be multicellular. And so these, uh, researchers published in Science Advances, their work looking at a bunch of rocks uh, from a formation in North China. It includes layers that are 1.6 billion years old, but there's been some dating that has taken those rocks back further. They have taken fossils out of the rocks near the same area. They dissolved them and found microscopic fossils. And in the microscopic fossils, they seemed to see cylindrical cells that were attached to each other, kind of like they had cell walls, like plants. Mm -hmm. And they think they see spores within the cell walls. So they think there were specialized ways of reproducing. So what they are saying is that they have discovered evidence that there were organisms that were multicellular about 600 million years before we think multicellular life existed based on this before evidence. We have, before we have uh, evidence of. Yeah. Because I think we think that it's old, much older than we have the evidence of. It's just a matter of, again, soft-bodied creatures not lending themselves to fossilization, not having a shell, not, yeah. not giving a good imprint in a rock or what have yeah. you. Yeah. So uh, this, you know, it's still debatable. People are questioning whether or not this is what the researchers think that they're seeing, but uh, uh, the researchers are themselves convinced that their evidence reveal these morphological details that uh, are obviously multicellular and that can be interpreted as eukaryotic and that eukaryotic multicellular humans, we're eukaryotes, uh, that our type of life uh, and probably photosynthesis even may have started earlier than we think. Mm. A lot earlier. Yeah, I don't know. I love this kind of stuff is always so interesting to me because, like I said, we're uh, basing our assumptions on like uh, chemistry that we know, on current morphology that we know, and we're looking at these things that are have been dissolved out of rocks and going, this is a thing, you know. This, but I think it's well, the, exciting. the earth captures uh, these does. things. And if it's uh, somewhere in the earth that hasn't, you know, so much of the crust is in constant upheaval and uh, in a solution where it's dissolved or it's being uh, pushed down or up into the elements and blown away and turned back into dust. Like when you find an area that has been undisturbed for billions of years, yep. that, nothing has changed you you can find evidence like this so there's not a whole lot of places on the planet where we can do this so this is an important site for sure yeah it's a very important site and i think it's something that uh people will be looking at a lot moving forward and continuing to you know question these results and really determine what's what what they've found and what what they're seeing here um you know i think always in science it's based on replication and being able to uh, come to a consensus over time with enough enough evidence but this suggests that like these structures are similar to green algae and but they're so much older 
And mm. what were they doing there? What happened? What's going on? Old rocks. So, scientists looking at the world, questioning things, having all sorts of ideas. They want to publish. They get peer-reviewed. Sometimes people go, uh-uh, and then there's a debate in the journals, and they fight each other in the journals, and sometimes they fight each other on social media. And <sighs> just Which brings us to a, a new segment on the show that feels like an old segment, but is a new segment, all the same, called... Justin rants about a problem, followed by more hope-filled words from Kiki. <laughs> I love that. I love that addition at the end of it. I really do. I, ho I, I hope I'm in a mood for the hope-filled words at the end of it. Okay, go rant. <laughs> okay, science has a problem, mostly due to publishing practices where publishing companies with profit motives uh, have very few guardrails when it comes to uh, what they publish. They have been for years now, many publications looking the other way when it comes to fraud and plagiarism even. They look the other way because they make more money if there are more papers submitted. Uh, we were talking earlier about the, the, the new platforms over the last uh, 15, maybe 20 years now of online publishing or the many, 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 many journals that have sort of sprouted up out of nowhere the increase in the amount of papers that are published, you know, it's it's like 10,000 a day or more now. It's so and many. And each of these, mm -hmm. when you, it used to be that there was a subscription paid to the prominent journals by all the universities. They all paid a ridiculous amount of money for a, a thin uh, group of papers that were published. And that's how the journals survived from the subscriptions. And now the these new the new wave is generating the income from the researchers submitting their papers to journals. 2000, 3000, 4000 a pop, uh, 10,000 papers a day or whatever it is now. You know, it's just ridiculous amounts of money are flowing in there. So this is bad because science has another problem. Uh, which is uh, is paper mills. So right, yeah. So I, I mentioned we, predatory journals earlier. Well, but yeah, paper mills. So paper mills are before They're you different. get to the predatory journals, yeah. right? Because yep. paper mills are companies that create basically fake research as a business. Yep. Uh, they create these papers and then they sell authorship to of these fake papers to anyone who wants to be on a research paper. This yep. is increasingly a popular choice amongst people in the medical uh, industry, either grad students or people who are currently working and don't have time to do research because they're too busy working, but want to show that they are doing research there or is a, it's job not, opportunities. Or yeah, and it's not research. it's not just the wanting to. If you're an MD, PhD, uh, there's a requirement for the PhD part of it for the pub. You have to publish a paper, so yeah. there are like certain requirements. And yeah, 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 you got to uh, spend Part of the money to make money. Yep. And so by paying to have your name on a research paper, you have nothing to do with, along with other people you have never, never met that you're not collaborating with uh, for research that wasn't actually conducted, but was published in a real journal. Getting that paper cited by other papers also helps, but that costs extra for that. You will need the citation mill upgrade package to your paper mill package don't you just go on like uh chat gpt for that that makes your citations up <laughs> oh no not to, to, to yeah, no so and there's also uh self citation of journals that's increasingly yeah. so so you've now you've published now maybe you've published a real paper your real paper has been submitted and there you get a suggestion from the editor hey you know what this reminds me of 10 other papers that we've published, you should cite them. Oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll add those citations then. Thank you for that, uh, editor, for uh, for giving me that helpful tip. And now that uh, publication's other 
uh, published studies have more citations than they did before. And this is increasingly and increasingly, uh, you will see. Uh, a normal scientific journal will have in the range of 2 to 3% self-citation where it's citing other studies that they published before. A lot of times if you delve into that, it's also because they're very specifically working on, you know, I think a lot of times people will be citing their own previous research because this is a continuation of that research and the things yes. that led them to start that research. So, yes. And if those are all published in the same journal, that's where you end up with this two to 3%. And uh, the average for these new generation of open access journals is more in the 12% range with some being as high as 20%. Okay. So, uh, depends on the journal, problem. right? Yeah. It's a problem. Yeah. It depends on the journal, right? It depends on the journal, right? Okay. So this is a, a, a big thing, uh, that depends on others. Some are credible. Some are less. So the peer review process in every major journal even can be considered dubious at best. And the retraction rate for bad papers is slow. It lacks a way to generate money. So most publishers don't even bother with their retractions. They don't even bother with internal investigations. The vetting process for papers is now really low. A lot of, because there's like so many thousands of papers that are, that are being pushed through, they have guest editors. These are people who may not actually even be in the specialty of the paper that they're reviewing, coming in and, and sort of doing the initial review of it. They have guest peer reviewers who, again, may or may not uh, be tied to the journal itself. They may not. They may be editors who are paid elsewhere by the paper. So anyway, there's this thing called impact factor of journals. It's curated by... Uh, Clarivate Analytics Web of Science Group, they use citations, a number of publications to create impact factors for journals. That is, citations is part of it. That's why there's a lot of self-citation going on and pressure to cite within the same journal that's publishing your work. So, But it's a form of credibility rating that they have put out. In 2023, Web of Science removed the impact factor of 82 journals including one of the world's largest that had a great impact factor and a, a wide distribution, a large number of distribution by meaning a large number of journals uh, of uh, papers being published within it. So 82 journals, these aren't individual research papers, but hundreds of thousands of papers published under the umbrella of journals that are no longer considered credible. Great first step, right? Uh, Web of Science has also been doing things like using AI. They've been developing AI because there's, there's such a volume of these papers that they can't humanly read them all, humanly investigate them all. So they're now using AI to start vetting uh, what's being published by these publishers. Many of the 82 that were that were delisted were under the Hindawi publishing brand. Yeah. Yep. And they got delisted right after they were purchased by Wiley Publishing for a ridiculous <laughs> amount of something near 300 million US dollars they paid for this publishing company. Uh, Wiley began an internal investigation after being delisted, having their new purchase <laughs> told, ah, yeah, it's not worth anything. Yeah. They became so overwhelmed with the retraction orama puke fest of regurgitated paper mill pulp that they had bought that they have by the end of last year. This is all happened last year. They bought it last. I think they purchased it last year, got delisted last year, and uh, they have now announced that they're retiring the brand that they bought entirely. Once they move a few hundred publications over to Wiley, which means exactly what? when you're moving the publication around, but maybe Wiley's going to have a much higher standard uh, going forward for what actually makes it into those publications. Meanwhile, the current edition of AAAS Science Journal has several stories about science fraud, a whistleblower report on a Chinese company bribing editors of publications. Uh, 
this is not just now, hey, you uh, come in, here's a paper, we can put your name on it. And then, hey, here's a publication we can get, uh, try to get into for it. Now we just want to bribe the editor in the, of the publication in the first place so that they are assured to put you in, so that the whole uh, network is complete. So it's it's this is framed, though, in the, as a problem for, like you were saying, a lot of the junk journals, predatory journals, less credible journals. But, you know, I've been reporting uh, previously on junk Chinese science publishing at yeah, all you of have the been major recently, publishers. Yeah. All of the major publishers, as if there's a different standard for the glut of these state-sponsored papers coming from China, that they would just cost too much to reject. Uh, and I'm looking at you, Nature. I'm looking at you, JAMA. So Nature is Elsevier. Uh, so it's a different, the, the Nature journals are under the Elsevier uh, umbrella corporation. And so I think... You know, that is the the corporation that I've heard people talk about a lot, especially with respect to make getting rid of paywalls and making uh, papers available to people. Um, coming from like having been in the academic world, taught, met and known people who have uh, gone, who, who have edited and actually run uh, journals and worked for some of these companies. Um, it's a really interesting ecosystem that we have created because we allowed there to be publishers like book publishers that need to make a profit and there are uh, public companies that have shares that then need to have quarterly returns. Um, and in that, uh, they have grown like nature. Uh, that journal is very well respected, high impact factor one of the most respected it's like science nature cell these are some of the tops top ones out there um but at the same time not all the papers are available to everybody and because of that as more and more scientists uh fight for open information so that people can have access to information and knowledge um the publishers are you know they're holding on to what they've got because they have to make their profits and, you know, but who's going to pay the editors. And at this point in time, when you have a peer review or a person who reviews a paper, you don't do that for money. You do that for free. So you have an editor who's probably paid by the journal, who's paid by the umbrella publisher. And that editor is looking through and goes, okay, maybe this paper, this paper, this paper, I, you know, now I'm going to send them out for peer review, sends them out, basically asks scientists who have a billion other things to do to read this paper and say what they think. How is it? Is it good? Is it bad? Whatever. Um, and they do that for free. Uh, I don't. That, that may be what's going on at... at uh... At cell, that may be at, what's going on at science, I, at nature, at cell, like all the all the really good old school journals, yeah, but the, not like, the new ones. The new ones. But scientists have been upset about this because, because they have too many. Yeah, and scientists have been upset because they're like, okay, well, I mean, this is part of my job as a scientist to be part of the community and help the research move forward and feed back into the what's going on. But uh, they're not paid well. They have to get grants. And then they're not paid to do these reviews, and that's extra time that the university doesn't pay them for. So I imagine that a lot, like, there are probably a lot of researchers who are like, oh, oh, okay, paper mill? What? Oh, it's a paper? I'll read it. And they, you know, they review it, and it's fine. P people need to make a living somehow these days. End stage capitalism. It's awesome. Well, then you got uh, JAMA. <laughs> Tama, <laughs> who's uh, been sort of a pioneer of this open sourcing, right? Get the information to the people should be able to read this scientific information. They're also one of the biggest growers uh, during this open source revolution. Yep. Uh, I recently asked they have JAMA a lot of ad. No, you go to JAMA, they have advertisements. Sure. Like you go to their papers, there's advertisements on the pages. It's like, uh, like I'm like old school bloggers. 
<laughs> making ad money is, is I'm like what okay and they're charging they're charging thousands of dollars to, uh, of course for submissions to yeah. there because they don't have a subscription pay side that's that's paying for everything yep. and so publishing it is really uh, putting it on a website and and being done with it at this point right but I recently asked Gemma if I could read the peer reviews on a peer reviewed study that huh. I had some serious concerns about and? and was told that the information was confidential. And? Not that it was behind a paywall and I had to join some other thing, but that the information was confidential that was used to advise on, on the paper and not something that was uh, for publication. So some journals will have the you can look up the the peer review you can see what the other who are, you know two or three researchers who read the paper and said oh i would be careful of how you used the framed the data here or did you uh, did you look at this uh, the way you have presented your your infographic uh could have a little refinement these sorts i of remember things. my first peer done. review and somebody do what other yours your statistics should not be this. Yeah, you're using this statistics and you should be using these statistics and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, okay, I got to go back and do it again. All right. You know, that's what you so, do. So, yeah. So the, the one I was looking at was a paper that was uh, uh, connected to Odyssey. Odyssey is this group of researchers and data professionals who have gotten together to, to use big data sets. Uh, and they also have... Uh, an undercurrent of funding from the pharmaceutical industry. And this paper had some just findings and conclusions that their own data even seemed to be counter uh, contradicting. So I just wanted to see what the peer review looked like on that paper, because gosh, I had some concerns that this was industry driven and that for some reason it was, you know, the data, the data just didn't make sense. But I, I was told I remember you report. You talked yeah. about this, like before you left and went, uh, you know, on your little sabbatical, getting a new yeah. job for a while, like you actually talk, I remember you talking about this paper. So you actually did dig in more. Yeah, we reached Love out to the, the to the folks over there and like tr just tried to get, you know, hey, can I see the peer review of this? That's all, all I want to do is read it and was told it was confidential. And so for the open access, open network JAMA journal, to have confidential peer reviews makes me question whether there is one, honestly. Like I have now, I have now doubts about the integrity uh, of JAMA as a whole. So another story uh, that was in science here recently was about, not in the, in the journal, uh, in the journal science or on the website for AAAS, it was about a dozen papers by the head of Dana Farber Cancer Institute, the head of, and three of the senior researchers needing to retract 57 papers published between uh, 1997 and 2017. This all came to light, not because of any peer review, not because of an internal look within uh, the journals, but because a blogger noticed recycled data was being used in a number of places in their studies, which could be accidents 57 times, or it could be data manipulation 57 times. 57 to... times? <laughs> so my point is that, uh, if I should limit myself to one here, is that scientific the scientific publishing industry, standards are too low. So low at this point that I do not trust you. And I was your biggest fan. But there was like... This is one, oh gosh, where is this one going to have been published? This was published in JAMA. Okay. Where I remember hearing an interview about this because I had to go and keep looking at this. This was uh, a trial of a Chinese medicine compound. Oh, yeah. This you were, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the You're one like, that How had, did this like, go through? Yeah. When you looked into it, it had ground up insects and all these different earth, like, and they combined it with a Western drug and said, hey, it has this positive impact. It's like, what and actually like, is but, that impact? What? Yeah. But what is what is even in this compound of like ground centipede, this kind of a spider, this sort of a flower, <laughs> that kind of an herb? It's and, holistic and Justin medicine. is just like making up a whole bunch of ingredients right now. He doesn't remember. No, I'm not. 
No, wait, no. Do you want me to read it? Hang on. Wait, Do you have me... the ingredients? Like, yeah. Is it yeah. really lit? No, no centipede, no centipedes and spiders. Come on. Uh, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Did I? Oh, maybe I did. Okay, here we go. <laughs> A pre. So they don't list in this JAMA article what the ingredients are of the compound. Mm -hmm. But I found a previous publication by the group uh, detailing the proposal for the study to look into the compound, which did list the ingredients. And they were Chinese scorpions, leeches, Chinese cockroaches, Chinese red-headed centipedes, the sloughed other sh outer shell of cicadas, red peony <laughs> root, sour jujube uh, seed, agar wood, white sandalwood, and synthetic Yay. borneol, a substance derived from camphor known to be highly toxic. Now, these are all combined and ground up into this compound that I can't pronounce quite properly, uh, but it's like Tong Sinlu, something like this. It's a Chinese traditional medical is, yeah, yeah, okay. thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, <laughs> and the compound was used with some level of ingredient from all of these things in conjunction with a Western medication to treat a thing and show the positive input. Now, this was so amazing to me that, first of all, they would not list in their publication uh, what was involved, what, what those ingredients were, just said a, a list of ingredients, but that this was could be considered science at that point. That this could be considered research. And I, I remember I delved so far into this that I got into an, uh, an interview with one of the publishers uh, who was talking about how they like, like, well, we had questions about whether or not we should publish that study. But we know, did it anyway. We're so important. seems so important and significant that we thought we we, sh we had. No, you're paid. We can tell when you're paid. We can tell when you're paid. When you're showing ground up centipedes of a holistic medicine, a state sponsored campaign in China currently having been announced as a goal by the Chinese legislative branch or whatever you want to call it, is to introduce holistic medicines into Western medicines as add ons that improve. And now we're seeing all these research papers that are trying to find that, and you're publishing them in your supposedly high impact, credible journal. I have lost. All respect for you, Jamma. You are delisted by me. If the web of science haven't hasn't caught you yet, they will. And I'm really curious. So, so here, number one, the addition of the Western <laughs> medicine compound. It sounds a lot like the uh, homeopathic medicines that are sitting on a lot of shelves that actually have things like epinephrine or you know actual poisons and toxins that can hurt your babies in them, but nobody talks about them, right? Oh, that's. that's it. That's the active component, but it's the homeopathy that's doing what it is for you, right? So that's number one. Uh, that's what it kind of rings as familiar as and similar to. And then the other side of it is I do not think it's wrong for Eastern medicine and traditions to try to incorporate themselves into Western medicine. Why, why are we separate and what are we doing? But evidence needs to be the basis and it has to be done right. And if what you're doing is putting a mishmash of like, you know, oatmeal from the kitchen sink, you know, in there, plus, you know, Dawn dish soap and whatever, and you're like, hey, it's great. Or how about leeches not... and cockroaches? I mean, and this year, this... shells. Everybody, if you really want to do this yourself in North America, there's two cicada populations that are going to be emerging this year. It's going to be massive and amazing. So find yourself some exoskeletons, everyone. Um, but yeah, I mean, look at the components individually. We know that there have been years of research into nutritional components like uh, turmeric curcumin, you know, trying to figure out what are the anti-inflammatory aspects and how is how are these food, these herbs that different people use, how do they actually work and what do they do and are they good and what are the, um, you know, like resveratrol, how many 
bottles of resveratrol do you need to <laughs> drink to actually have it have any effect on you? Um, you know, it, and I think that is the problem. You can't have us, and I, I think you're right. For JAMA to put this kind of a study ahead and for the, the person you spoke to to say that this seemed like too important a result not to publish, you're right. That's faulty. And it that 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 study was faulty. And there needs to be more control. And that's lacking. If yeah. if 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 Eastern medicine practitioners want the stuff they use to get integrated, and if Western medicine practitioners are excited about that, let's do the science right. Yeah. Right. But but my problem is if an authoritarian government is demanding research from its scientist community to do a result mm -hmm. and they keep finding that result and that result keeps ending up in Western papers Some, because there's always, money involved. And somehow it's always it, significant. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. no, that's bias and that's not okay. That's low standard. And that's like, at this point, like, this is what's uh, this is the biggest fan of science that you can get. And I'm like, I don't trust any research out of China. I don't trust anything in JAMA. I have I have to read the study just word by word and and make sure that it's there if it's even in nature. Cuz they're the ones that gave me the the microbiome study on centennials that was people who who couldn't have a birth certificate until 1950 and couldn't prove an age over 72. Like they're doing a bad job. And there's great research that's out there. But allowing all of this. So, you know, every once in a while we talk, we need more people in research. Yeah, I think we need, I think we need less people in research. I, I think there's too many papers. I think you need to not be a grad student and publish a research paper. You can just do the experiment and know that you've gotten a result. It doesn't need to be published. The world isn't waiting to hear about your undergrad study on whatever it is. I think I think that uh, so I'll argue back against that. I think graduate students do need to publish and be a part of publishing because by doing that, they learn how papers are written and they learn how the process works. So they can move into future stages stages of research research and lead that research and lead the writing and know what they're doing. I think the issue is that the system is set up in such a way that we have um, uh, hiring practices that are based on the number of papers and what journals you've published in, in the first place. How high impact are you to begin with? Oh, you published in science, you get a job, what? Um, and then from there, so people are, okay, so like Harvard, MIT, the big, big schools here in the US, like it is super competitive and ridiculously cutthroat because everybody is tearing each other down to get the first result, to get the paper in science or nature. Like that's like, because if they do that, then they get a job and that's the beginning of their career. Then once they get in as an early stage scientist, they have to keep publishing, publish or perish. If you don't put out, put out high impact research, then you're not going to get tenure. You're not going to get grants. And if you don't get that, you don't have a lab. You can't support a lab. You can't support research assistants. You cannot do anything. And, and suddenly, I think it's a good system because no, it but, keeps the pressure on, right, no, of doing, no, doing no. high impact research. But, but you can't let them cheat getting there. You have That's to have a the, gatekeeper. No, that's and that's the problem. The publisher parish forces people into situations where they make the wrong choice. They lie. They publish false data. They create things that will get them published so that they will get the job because maybe they come from, you know, a background that expects it of them. Maybe they have, you know, type, you know, whatever type A psychology or whatever. They have to do this because they have learned in their life that the only thing to do is succeed and success is publishing and getting a job and getting tenure. And that's what they do. And I think this is what's wrong because what it creates is a you know, com com friendly competition is great because it spurs people on. Yeah. But what is happening is we have created a, a system 
where it's so competitive and cutthroat and uh, it just it people I, have to do it and they'll do anything if that's what they believe is where they need to be and they and and you end up with people I I I knew a postdoc whose paper had been rejected because one of her competitors in the same field was a peer reviewer and that peer reviewer negatively commented on her paper and then just right after published basically the same research wow yeah so, so that's, there is that's pretty sketch it's it's sketch all the way to the top and the, and the the reason is the universities and the financial uh motivation and how it all works and if you get into a university you then have to publish and you have to get grants so you have to publish at a high impact so you have great ideas and you get the grants and then you can hire people and the more money you have the more money you get to keep but oh the university takes 60 percent overhead for many grants you bring in so it, <sighs> eventually you take the pay for peer review from the paper mill because you need some money or you figure out how to do some crowd crowdfunding. You figure out how you can actually make some extra money so you can pay your lab manager because you don't have any extra money because you haven't gotten a grant and you can't do the research and you can't write the paper unless you have somebody else to help you run the, run the lab. The whole system is a mess. Um, yeah, it's not the papers necessarily. That's part of it. The publishing part of it is just part of the system. But yeah, yeah. Uh, it anyway, is, it, it's thank goodness for YouTube. A good gatekeeper, <laughs> I think, at least when there weren't a lot of publications. And so to yeah. get published anywhere was a high impact because they didn't just take anybody to publish. They, and they had real peer reviewers because they weren't throwing... Uh, 500 uh, papers that they wanted you to read. They gave you three a year. Yeah. So let's go even further on this, though, and go back not just to the papers, but to the grants and to the paper and research that we've actually seen that has shown that there's bias in the reviewers for grants and papers if they know who is writing them. And people of color and women are, ref are, are not reviewed well in those situations and they are less likely to get the grants. And so you're talking about gatekeepers and you're talking about it historically as being a good thing. But in fact, I think what we are in the middle of seeing and what you're witnessing and what we're all witnessing with the breakdown of the publishing industry and what's happening with like these, these mills and everything <laughs> is that there's a revolution taking place. For over 15 years, 20 years, people have been trying to fix publishing. There are a lot of good people who are trying to make it better. There are people who are taking advantage of a broken system and because the system has been broken for so long. There is a revolution happening within the institutions trying to turn over the diversity in these institutions, trying to not make it the thing where, oh, the black person is the person, you know, they, they not only have to run their lab and uh, write grants and do all this stuff, oh, they also have to sit on the diversity committee and they also have to sit on this other committee because nobody else has that experience and so they're asked to do extra. And the whole system, like, historically, we can't yeah, look back on it as the good old days. I'm going to have to rename this segment. <laughs> Sorry. This is not called the new name for this segment. This is a new, new segment. Is Justin rants about a problem followed by less hope filled words from Kiki. Nope. And that's where I'm going to turn it around. And that's what I'm saying is that I think the revolution is needed and it's good. And I'm glad that people are starting to try to change things. They're trying to create better hiring practices. They're trying to create better peer review practices. The preprint 
archives are there for a reason and people are trying to use them well. There are good open access journals and that are not paper mills. And there are people like Elizabeth Bick, who uh, we we interviewed, who was um, you know checking papers for false images and made up data. And um, you know there are people who are out there who are working to make science better. So yeah, I agree with you. I agree with your rant. It's broken. But I think that there are a lot of people who believe in it and uh, not necessarily want to, you know, be like, oh, let's fix the institutions and keep the institutions the same. Let's build something better. And I think that's hope. I mean, I have that hope that that is where we are going right now. And unfortunately, as you go to something better, you have to tear old stuff down and it looks messy. It does. And it's going to be uh, incredibly hard to change because if you do like anybody, if you show them, Hey, you've been doing something wrong for a long time. Their self-preservation is going to be, ah, but there's never been a problem, right? Ah, that's, it's not my fault. Oh gosh. Ah, because you're also showing that, a lot of the way that publishing has worked in the past has been inviting fabrication, has been inviting the paper mills. And maybe wasn't papers. controlled enough. You know, AI is going to really revolutionize this. And I think Web of Science could go a lot further than it's gone so far. But granted, they've done this just last year, got rid of 82 publications. So maybe I shouldn't be too harsh because it sounds like they're on top of it. But you could do simple things like, 82 publications. Show me not, a researcher that has been on more than six papers in a year. I, I can tell you one of the ones I was complaining about that I was trying to look at the peer review. It's a group of researchers that sort of end up on each other's papers all the time, sometimes in disparate things. One of them, I think, has been on 20 papers in a year. And I'm sorry, you have not contributed to 20 research papers. Or you year. have, you have. There is, uh, th you know about order, publication author order, right? Uh, so right. first author is the person who did most of the work. Mm -hmm. Second author is usually the person who is like, you know, their partner and, you know, they decided that, okay, I did most, first author did most of the writing or whatever, second author maybe did this, like, a lot of the statistics or whatever. And it goes down the line Last author is the person who runs the lab. And they didn't necessarily do any of the work, but they run the lab. And so their right. name I'm is not on talking the about just I'm not talking about the person running the lab. No, it's but I'm just I just yeah. want to make it clear that there yeah. is a really interesting hierarchy and it's very important and it's the debate very often about authorship placement when a paper is being submitted is actually really important. Like graduate students, they really want that first authorship, at least on one paper. Um, Cause it shows that they did the work. I was um, in charge of some things. Yeah. But then you get the big labs who actually have a lot of people. Like there are labs out there that have 50, six, like they have big labs working out there. And that primary investigator who runs the lab it's on every paper that comes out. So he might, that, that he or she, I'm not, I'm not gonna, right. what, who, right. they uh, could be on six, 10, 12 totally. papers and a year. People that you're going to collaborate with. This was, yeah. this was, uh, this is researchers at different universities uh, across the planet or different labs who are tied through Odyssey, which is a. Yeah, yeah. So you're like, you're thinking about the Odyssey thing. Yeah, going back. I'm to thinking that. about the Odyssey thing, but I'm also, mm -hmm. I could be talking about a dentistry school in India where students uh, regularly publish studies two, three a month and get them published in journals that are no longer uh, accredited. But they advertise that their school has the most publications per student of any university for dentistry or whatever, um, which gives them a lot of prominence. And people were like, well, maybe I should go to that school where yep. they're doing research on... Yeah, it helps the PR Dental and the marketing. With citations the, yeah. to themselves for a study on cotton candies 
uh, ability to withstand a high wind. Like what? I, like a lot of times their citations have nothing to do with the study because it's a paper mill. So they're just grabbing things from other places where they're getting paid. Uh, but uh, like, but that's an example. Yeah. Like run through that. Where did it come from? Yeah. Run through. Uh, are they trying? Like if you can come up with the the algorithm for. Is this is this a state uh, policy of of some level of internal self propaganda that the the Chinese authoritarian state has been pushing for? Is this a paper that confirms that whatever view it is? Like, look at language, look at uh, authorship, look at connections to uh, pharmaceuticals. Like, we can uncover a lot of this. And guess what? You've published. There, the problem I have is there isn't any mechanism of consequence. There isn't any mechanism of like, hey, you know what? We've got, we, we can tell that every study you have, have worked on uh, is in the, the favor of this. Yeah. Uh, so I guess when, it, when you, when you come down to like the government, the, like product. you're talking about the, the government pushed or, or industry type. or industry uh, or or industry yeah i mean but at this but at the university level we have seen a lot of stories recently where uh researchers have had their data like shown to be false going back like mm -hmm. there's been investigations mm -hmm. um into their entire history of publications and it's yeah. like big falsifications have been pulled out and they get fired. So yeah, yeah it can happen. It can happen. And then happen, you don't get grants anymore. Your grants are taken away. And then suddenly the NSF is like, well, you owe us money because you didn't do it right. You know, and then you have to pay it back. So here in the US, I think at the institutional level for academics, when it is proven and the institution yeah. is like, yeah, we'll follow it up and we'll mm -hmm. go with this because it looks good for us to actually like, you know, do something. Let me let me put it, it this way yeah. then. Yeah. I think that if you are a medical student uh, who has paid for authorship on a paper you did not contribute to, you should not be allowed to have a medical license. <laughs> Period. Yeah. Flat. Like you need consequences for this stuff. You know they used to have that test that whatever that a horrible test. People were like, oh, it's the big medical test. You know, everybody's afraid of it. Well, they got rid of it. Uh, they, it's now a pass fail anyway. It's no longer uh, uh, has a score attached to it, right? And so now uh, the 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 talk is that you have to have these publications because that's the only way to differentiate yourself. You used to be like, I nailed it. I got like the highest score. Hire me because I'm smart and everybody. You haven't published. Yeah, I was too busy studying and learning my craft. Oh, that's a good point. Boom. Now so there's nothing. There's a pass fail. So now they have to do these public. But if somebody, and this is apparently where this, uh, those, those pay to play in the United States academic circle is the most egregious is in the medical, uh, student, uh, uh yeah, that category. in itself is a very competitive industry. Like, yeah, but you want to be a doctor that helps people and you're going to start your career showing unethical behavior. Yeah. Great. Bye. There we go. So, this is the way, this is the way you separate. So uh, I think those who I, really shouldn't be in the field. I so think I think AI can help. I think Sorry. listening to your rant uh, and listening to your commentary, I don't think that we need to highlight any one country, any one kind of people, any one government, or you know, any one industry. But I think the big take home from what you're talking about is that there are not enough controls, and right now we are. Uh, the, the publishing industry, because it needs money and researchers need money, there is a big hole and it is causing um, an unethical behavior. It's causing false data to be published. It is allowing people to get places that they shouldn't. And it's, uh, it's going to hurt people because we're going to end up stuff with stuff like the what was it, 20 years of Alzheimer's research that was based on a particular protein that like just recently they Doesn't discovered exist. that like the original data was not even solid. Um, 
And so it's the, that is the take home is that there, it's not just JAMA. That's one, but all of them, the El Selvi, El Sevier, um, the, the fact that there are paper mills, the fact that it's, you can pay to be on a paper, like mm -hmm. all of it, it doesn't matter. Like whatever country a scientist is publishing from doesn't, you know, but if they're doing good, oh, no, science, these are all publications. And the, and the ones I'm pointing no, out are all publications no, no, know, in the United States. Yeah, the publications it, it, are all in the United States. But it, it, if it's good science, there should be somebody who can tell it's good science versus it's not good science. And that person is not going to be swayed by money mm -hmm. or by influence. Um, and I think that's the problem that we have right now. And and yeah, that's what I was saying. I hope that's I, that's what people are trying to fix. And that's what we need to be fixed. And I totally agree with you. And it, yeah. There I are, do yeah. think it's fair to point out if certain if if egregious research is coming from certain sources, I think it's perfectly acceptable to point it out. I have no pro I have no problem with that. Right, but if you if you find a trend, you find a trend. But like that's just one trend, yeah. right? There are like probably yeah. others all over the place that you just haven't seen, you know. So, um, I think yeah. Um. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I agree. Science, we've got an issue because people need to make money and that's where it's at right now. And we have, you know, for, for years together on the show, we've talked about the fact that ph the pharmaceutical industry has hidden evidence, uh, hasn't published results mm -hmm. that didn't look good and just publish what they want to. Um, you know, we don't have... You know, there's like one journal for uh, negative results, but nobody publishes in it, right? <laughs> like, it's like, what are we learning from each other? Like when it comes to science, we need to learn from our failures, but instead people are making up wins and that's, that's screwing everybody. Yeah. We can yeah, do no, better. We can, we can, mm -hmm. but you know, hey, journals, you can reject more okay. yeah it's okay <gasps> oh man could you imagine if they did reject more and just just the editor's like no 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 and but then, i'm trying then... to give you four thousand dollars no 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 thank you then if you reject more then you I'm don't need as many peer reviewers mm -hmm. yeah i like this <sighs> So it's bundled stuff too, because now it's like there's intermediaries that are like, hey, I have 20 studies to submit. Uh, should I go to your journal or should I go somewhere else? And then the dollar amount is like multiplied for the, like, this is just, anyway, mm -hmm. don't trust anything you read. Don't trust anyone you talk to. Don't trust anything you know. Don't trust any, uh, I'm just going to. I will, I'm going to caveat that with. Um, consensus and triangulation. So you can read one thing and you can also read a bunch of things, but if you're only in like one little bubble of the world, yeah. you got to step out of your bubble. You have to go listen to other people. You have to read other things. You have to try other, like one paper. We've always said this. The results from one paper are not gonna gonna change the world right it is the the results that get put together yeah. over time Community. that change stuff right so yeah yeah no cherry picking <laughs> except if it's in the spring and there are lots of actual cherry trees and it didn't freeze and rain and the, the, it's a nice cherries and go ahead and pick the cherries and they're delicious it's great i'm just constantly surprised though now of how much of, of just how bad this problem is. It's just like people like don't have standards. It's worse. People who, are, who people who are, you assume would have standards aren't having standards. And and, and, and the thing that to me, I think everything. Forever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and then beyond that, it's not just the publications. Then it's media and it's the 
blogs and the media sites that people go to uh, for information that copy headlines and take, you know, just whatever it was and they don't question it. Great. And I already had lost confidence in them yeah. long ago. That's why they're not even part of the conversation. Like they have no credibility on science whatsoever. Who cares what they're saying or talking about anymore? I don't because they're trash. However, but I've always I loved... still thought, and I know that a lot of those side predatory publications that, oh, XYZ journal that you've never heard of before because it's specific to this paper that somebody wrote, apparently. I get that those are trash, but why not now when it's when it's in the mainstream journals on a regular basis? That's when you say it's gone, it's become critical mass. I guess is the thing or something like that, where now it's going to, it's going to be a runaway, uh, the chain reaction of like, you can kill science. You okay. can't, it's a living thing of people sharing knowledge and replicating knowledge. And if you continue to infect it with garbage that you want to publish and make money off of, you're going to kill the thing that feeds you. The thing that keeps us uh, warm and healthy and uh, keeps us from dying from the the next pandemic, you're going to kill it because you're going to ruin the credibility, which science, if nothing else, is a process based on that credibility, the ethic mm -hmm. of how you work, the unbiased truth. And it cannot stand for what you are, what you are doing. Uh, it should reject it. And it's sad to hear how tight of a bind uh, researchers are in and getting their research and jumping through hoops but on the other hand you know uh there's a lot of people calling themselves researchers who aren't yeah agreed so, anyway rant out <laughs> <laughs> and still more words of hope you know oh yeah um, well, yeah we never got to the part well, we, 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 i did give again. words of hope a little bit um but, Some people, uh, good people, are trying to do good things somewhere. It's just hard. I, okay. Uh, and, in it, and, and in addition to uh, your rant, you know, I was reminded this last week when I lived in the 1890s here in Portland <laughs> of how much science is useful and how understanding how basic concepts work can be used to your advantage to make your life better. We had things going wrong electrically. We had things going wrong with plumbing and other stuff, but because... How come you're plumbing? What you had to, on top not, of I mean, the pipes, power being out? Pipes, yeah. you know, like don't oh, let yeah. them freeze. It was, seriously, oh, it was... the cold. Oh, it was 29 yeah, yeah. degrees in my house. It was so cold. <laughs> no heat. I had to... Oh. <laughs> trying not to let any pipes freeze and keep oh, the water going. and But it's because of understanding basic concepts of physics, hmm. electricity, understanding how current works. You know, we were able to hotwire our heater to our, gen our, 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 you know, our heating system, our furnace to our generator. Um, yeah. We now also have like these really cool new lithium battery uh, backup packs that can put out as m almost as much energy as a gas guzzling generator. And they're quiet, which is really nice. It's got really silent, yeah. And these things, it's engineering that put them together. You know, our house is put together through engineering, all of it. You know, engineering failed when the power lines fell down because of the trees. Um, <laughs> but it's, figured out how to engineer trees properly. That's it. Eh, but it's science that helps us understand how to maybe keep the trees from falling down next time. It's science that has gotten us to the point where we understand how the current runs through can can run through lines and power a house. It's science that has allowed this house to stay uh, above, <laughs> slightly above freezing, so the pipes didn't freeze. It's science that gives us the batteries. It's science that formed the basis for the innovation that has allowed our society to move forward from 1890 to 2024.
Um, and so we need to foster that basic inquiry. We need to foster an environment that allows people to figure out how things work. And, you know, and, so and I agree, also- things are weird right now and they're, they're breaking, but they're breaking all over the place. But I feel like we have a lot of good people. I think science just needs to spend more time trying to kill vampires. Oh, yeah. Okay. Werewolves? Just vampires. Oh, I was thinking uh, paper mills and pulp publishing. But <laughs> oh, but yeah. uh, those are vampires that are feeding off of science or the people's desire to, to know more. Uh, as vultures, as vampires, drinking the blood of science for their own profit. <sighs> science needs to, you know, as a community, figure out how to take them down. Mm. I think AI will help. How to do better. Yeah, I, I think, think it will help. More I think right now it's a question. It's questionable but, and it's not, but oh, yeah, it'll help. We need a scientific blacklist, don't we? We need like, this person did, because like, who knows what <laughs> nonsense. I want to know everyone who paid for, I want to know, I want a list of everyone who Easy. paid for a re- that have their name on a research paper who has a medical license. I want every one of those names. You can probably every do one that. Of those names. Find databases. And I want, and I want like, them or, open source yeah. publish that is what I want to see. Yeah. AI can sort yeah. through all that data yeah. super fast. <sighs> what was it? The head of We've uh, sorted. Was, we've sorted. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we've sorted. We've ranted. We've had a whole thing. I can do it again. Uh, That's what's scary. I'm like, I'm like, I was ready to go again. Like, ah, How can I? More ranting. Still not satisfied with my, my level of disgust. <laughs> 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 oh my goodness. Okay, don't. <laughs> it's all but right to be realistic, but have a little that. optimism because there are good people in the world, and uh, you know. Surround your peop- yourself with the helpers. Surround yourself with the people who make you laugh. Surround yourself with the people who challenge you and help you to be better. Surround yourself with people who help you find your joy. Hmm. Let's do that. And on that note, I want to say thank you all for being here and helping me find my joy tonight. I needed that. And Justin, thank you. Everyone in the chat room, thank you for all your comments and uh, the Discord, of course. Thank you for being there. Um, (laughs) Closing in on a tight 150. Thanks, Identity. (laughs) Uh, Gord, R and Lore, thank you for helping to make sure that our chat rooms are nice, safe, happy places to be. Fada, thank you for all your help with the show notes and keeping us on track and like reminding me to tell you whether or not we actually did have a show going on tonight. Um, you know, keeping me going. Thank you. Uh, Identity Four. thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you so much for uh, your editing of the show. Just all of you can't do it without you. And especially I have to say thank you to our Patreon sponsors. So thank you to Aaron Anathema, Arthur Kepler, Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smitch, Richard Badge, Bob Coles, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, George Chorus, Pierre Velazarb, John Noam, Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Chris Wozniak, Vagard, Chefstad, Donathan Stiles, aka Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan, Shubru, Sarah Forfar, Don Mundus, Pig, Albert, Stephen Alberon, Cyril Myshak, Daryl Myshak. I have had um, wine this evening. Sorry. Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hess and Flo. Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard Brun- Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, G. Burton, Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramis, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, Lawn Makes, EO, Adam Mishkon, Kevin Parishan, Aaron Luthen, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Bob, Paul D. Disney, not Bob. Hi, Bob. Uh, David Simmerly, Patrick, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele. I did it. I said all the names. <laughs> Barely. Thank you all for supporting Twist. 
We really can't do it without you. And if any of you out there uh, would like to help support Twist and keep us going, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. We'd love your support. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific Time, Thursday, 5 a.m. Central European Time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Oh, and I just forgot Blair wasn't here. Want to listen to us as a podcast? (laughs) Yes! Search for This Week in Science wherever the podcasts are found. If you enjoy the show, get your friends to subscribe to for more information on anything you've heard here today. Show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can even sign up for a newsletter, newsletter that we promise we won't send. And you can contact us directly. You can email me, Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just put twist in the subject line so your email doesn't get spam filtered into one of Justin's pessimistic rants that, um, I don't know, just, you don't, don't get ranted. <laughs> uh. You can also hit us up on the uh internet yeah some places we are at twist science at dr kiki and at blair's menagerie we love your feedback if there's a topic you would like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview a haiku that comes through in the night please let us know and we'll be back here again next week we hope you'll join us once again for more great science news And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. (laughs) This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science, it's the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science... Oh, you just might understand. It is the after show. Oh, 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 it's the after show. Long show today. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it was good. Uh, Maybe, Rachel, you might... Uh, edit out all the ranty stuff. I think we only have an hour, hour and a half over on KDBS these days. I'm not sure. That was way too long for the radio. Um, I love all you guys uh, for sticking around for our big rant conversation. Um, Was it too inside baseball? Like, was that too much? Or did you feel like you, uh, that was valuable? I would love to know if that was something that was interesting. Thank you, zombie Tom Hanks. I I just got to make sure that when the rant happens, that there's enough context and that we're uh, actually giving (laughs) good information. Adeo Wilson, thank you for dancing. I always dance. That's what the music's for. You have to dance at the intro and the outro, for sure. What are you doing, Fada? Uh, yeah. Hi, Bob. I've been watching, finally, For All Mankind. And I love it. Uh, but it's so dramatic. I don't know. These, these characters, they're bothering me because I get so invested. <sighs> Thank you, Flying Out Valuable. You need to know that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. 
Paul. It needed to be discussed. Mary Gertz, it was on point and valid. Great. I'm really glad uh, because sometimes I really want to talk about stuff like that. And I want to talk about the broken systems and I'm glad Justin brings it. Um, you know, but it's outside the norm of us just discussing the science. So it's, um, you know, kind of nice to be able to go off format a little bit and do that every once in a while. We have a format. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, did, did, I did you just, like... did, did I just died a little inside? I don't know. I don't feel like, <laughs> I don't feel like we veer off, uh, of our just bringing stories very often. No, no. I mean, that's but what I, I was saying. Like it's in those, this has been a recurring theme. Uh, and it has but... become more and more consistent over the years. Yeah, and, and a Growing. lot of it came to from uh, moonlighting as a science journalist and getting moonlighting like you haven't uh, been doing it for. <laughs> I know you were right. You've been writing stories for. I know actually and writing so. the stories of, but the difference yeah. the difference there is here. I'm selecting stories. Here I'm selecting the stories to talk about. So if mm. something looks nah, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going into, uh, you know, I know actually a lot of the studies that I'm, I was covering are our nature, our JAMA, our cell. Uh, they are those. And then some from the fringes where, you know, I'm like, okay, well, your mice weights that you took uh, don't match male right, uh, mice, but they do match female mice. Yet you're saying they're all male. The study was on sperm. So wait a second. So like, but, but it, because I'm not selecting s s the stories that they're being, uh, you know, tossed at you to, to me, write about. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them I'm like, wow, this is an amazing thing that I would have missed because this is not a subject I'm normally uh, s sort of scanning for. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of really amazing stories that I got to cover. And there was also a lot of research that, you know, once I delved into what, what was in the paper, you know, the details of the paper. I'm like, I don't understand how this was published. Yeah. I don't understand how this is published in a prominent impact uh, journal because well, I it think even, looks bad. Yeah. And then was, like I was saying with the media, even beyond that, the fact that somebody said, Hey, this is a study that we want to cover and this is a press release and, or there are the press release, sites that you know the it's all stuff so gets parroted like it's parroted all over yeah typically yeah. the ones i got and it's it was a good organization i was working for uh they're not paid uh to do the publication so there isn't a hey we would like you to cover our story here's a payment for mm -hmm. it right uh they typically also would if a university has done a press release on a paper then they aren't covering it typically they're not covering something that the university has already put out their uh breakdown of what the the, the story is uh typically there uh sometimes there is other coverage that is out there and other online uh journalistic uh sources uh very often I find that I tend to read those after I've done my study, my my version of it, so that I can see if I've I've missed something, if somebody else has already published on it uh, days before. Um, what is very interesting is how often my version of the of the story of the write up is completely different <laughs> uh, than than what uh, what the other coverage is. It's like, wow, they actually read the same study I did, maybe. And got it yeah. wrong. Also, what nope. I was found was funny. Or they didn't read that, the study and they just went off the press release. What was also funny is then I, I occasionally go back to try to look up one of my uh, studies. Like, oh, what was this thing? Because I'm looking up for twists. So I go to Google my my story to see if I can find mm -hmm. it so I can br bring it into the show. And then I find versions of my story written by other people. Uh -huh. Published in other countries. Hmm, yeah. It's typically India because it's in English. Don't you feel I don't, I like, don't catch it if it's somewhere else. But a lot of there's a lot of 
of other journalists who don't have you feel honored verbatim or through yeah it's a little bit like oh i'm getting stolen from That's you've sweet. been recognized hmm. I haven't been stolen from. <laughs> and then and then also i noticed like there's this very interesting like i'll look at it i'll, I'll put out a, you know some of the stories or you know uh fives and tens of thousands of views or whatever and then there'll be one that's got like 250,000 views in the first week. And I'm like, oh, wow, people were really interested in this cave art. And then I find it's on the, you know, it's made the rounds of like ancient alien conspiracy theory websites. Is a whole, and I'm like, oh, now yeah. I understand why people are in that, uh, in, in that sphere, that media yeah. sphere of, of uh, ancient alien nonsense, because they got way more hits than I got for the new gene editing technique that might actually cure several diseases is they took, <laughs> but so, I mean, this goes, this goes to, I mean, if honestly years ago, if I, <laughs> I had really, really wanted this show to be a success, um, we should have been more sensational. I mean, we do fun fringe stories every once in a while cause they're interesting yeah. and they like are interesting questions, but we like, could have I totally never... Muller and scullied it. Yeah, we yeah, totally could. <laughs> yeah, but we never actually present it as like the end, like final word, right? It's like, well, this is interesting. Yeah, and look what the these, like, it's part of like, okay, so there are these people working on this. And that, like, yeah. I think that's important. And it's all yeah, in the presentation. Yeah, because arcing stories and subjects all throughout uh, the body of work that we've put together. Yeah, totally. and the, pro the problem with us is that um, I am not the person who's ever going to say, you know, this is how you, uh, you know, cure worms. I don't know. I don't, this is how you, <laughs> this is how you lose weight. This is how you do it. I'm not yeah. that. I'm not right. going to do that because. Right. Yeah, we started with the wrong ethic to make money. <laughs> to make well, I think we started with the right one to cover science. And I think that's also why it can be like when I'm yeah. getting frustrated with source materials that look paid mm -hmm. for because, hey, we've done this show without selling out for a long time and you already had a good revenue stream and then sold out. Like I get not having a revenue stream and selling out. That's tempting. But having what... a big revenue stream and selling out, that's a... Uh, okay, so I'm going to say some words, ethical. and I'm not going to name names, mm -hmm. okay. but there are scientists who have video program streams, whatever, podcasts, whatever, who are very popular, lots of downloads, like, and I think maybe they started out with the right intentions mm -hmm. to educate Are we talking people. science communicator or, or, or no, you're talking no, about they're, scientists. They're Scientists who have decided the communicator zone. they right. have decided okay. to be science communicators, and I don't think they've ever actually gotten science communication training. I mean, you know, they have. They don't. I watched them do it, and the Gosh, people. I were naming names because then I can. I'm not going to name names because that's. The, I'm not going to do it, but I get super frustrated. Because over and over again, I see people enter the science communication sphere. And right now, there's a huge push from the government, from university, to actually get scientists to be the communicators. And I honestly don't think all scientists should be the communicators because I, I, they don't know no, how to not communicate. Not everybody's good at it. Yeah. They're not good at Yeah. Not everybody. Some are great. Whatever. Um, but these particular individuals who have gotten really popular among certain audiences, they don't understand, like, audience. They don't understand who they're talking to. They don't understand what they're doing. And some of them actually have gotten to the point where they, uh, they speculate and they simplify and they sensationalize. And they break things down to basic, like, how to's and they uh get on and they have these long diatribes about things they really absolutely know nothing about and yeah. and they they don't talk as if it's something that they are learning about and trying to figure out they talk as if they okay. know it yeah. and 
I am over it. <laughs> I'm so mad at these people and they get so many more viewers because they give the, the, the TV news, they give finality. They give what is like, they give like a, you know, full rounded, this is the story. End of story. That's it. You yeah. don't have to talk to anyone else. I give you the story. But if they're also like, and I don't know it. who you're talking about, but if they're like <laughs> uh, getting uh, a a ride along in a self driving vehicle, for instance, and talking about <laughs> the wonders and the greatness of it all, and then all of a sudden uh, you realize, like, oh yeah, this was a paid commercial that I just watched. That has nothing to do with where uh, the self-driving car is actually at. Yeah. Yep. And that's a lot of it. And there are these people doing podcasts and interviewing people and, you know, and then turning it into like self-help and other stuff. And it's like, you're not a self-help guru. You're a whatever scientist and i'm not going to say oh it. yeah um, the but... psychologists have been doing this for forever so you can name all those names those people are all trash <laughs> the, am... whole, the whole self-help psychology like okay i get it you did a couple of papers uh on psychology as a grad student and now you're a influencer in mental health no that's not how your profession works it's not how your field works. And actually, your field is greatly flawed to begin with. So the last thing they need is somebody else going out there and throwing out nonsense and claiming that it's backed up by science. Uh, yeah. you know, you know, I could you know who else I could go after? I could go after TED Talks. Good gosh, what a low standard that is. <laughs> uh, I actually like, you know, it's like one of those things where people are like, Kiki, when are you when are you gonna do a TED? Why haven't you done a TED Talk yet? And it was you know, it's probably one of the things that I should have done to like advance my career, create my brand and do all that stuff. But I, I couldn't do it because I don't actually, like at first maybe they started with good intent, but I think now like there's pseudoscience and no, some there's no the way to tell the, the difference. There's no some way to tell the, the difference. With tens of millions of views are in that exact category of psychology and uh, that are probably and that part turned of that, into that turned into the, maybe a nova special or something one of these that was all but, that all the i think i talked about this on the show that the data from the study that they talked about in their ted talk was fake that came out in the like the reproducibility crisis where there's like the group of uh i think it's like psychologist psychology professionals who are like trying to reproduce all these studies and they're like we can't the foundational <laughs> not just studies foundational. Also, they're trying to reproduce the foundational studies for their field <laughs> and they cannot yeah, yeah. so and, and I, it's uh, it's because that, fraud yeah. has been part of psychology research bias has been part of psychology research for uh for such a long time because it's hard not to be a human biased about human behavior i suppose I want scientists to be, I want people to be excited about scientists. I want scientists, I mean, maybe not, I used to think that scientists should be rock stars, but I don't think they should anymore. I think scientists should just be respected. <laughs> you know, that I think, you know, that there are, there are jobs that people do that are worthwhile and, you know, some of them are entertainment, some of them are curiosity, and some of them are building rockets that go to the moon. Like teaching our kids, you don't value that. Like teachers don't get valued as much. Like there's so much librarians. We need to value librarians more. But anyway, instead, we like watching certainty from people. You don't really have the credentials on YouTube right. videos, or and, well, you know, and, and I'm and saying this, that, and I'm going to say it from a place of, yeah. uh, okay, I have a PhD. Yeah. I did wildlife biology, conservation as an undergrad. I did physiology, neuroscience as a PhD. I've published. I studied a lot of stuff. I don't know everything. I've never known, and but it's been my curiosity, and I've always tried to come at it from a place 
of learning myself and trying to help other people learn and not from the place of, I know all this stuff. Right. I've learned a lot over the years, but I, there's all I've learned is that I don't know anything, Jon Snow, whatever. Well, and, 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 you know, so part of this too is like what you're identified as the, uh, as a, a solution is also the problem. Mm -hmm. yep. Uh, one of the things, one of my biggest, uh, things I'm uh, a fan of or humans of, of, of history. I'm a fan of is, yeah. is John Dewey. And he's, Ooh, he's the Dewey not a system. No, it's not. He's a different Dewey. <laughs> the Dewey family was involved in all kinds of cool things, but that's the Dewey a Dewey's. different Dewey. John Dewey was the education czar of the United States. I uh, wrote okay. a book in uh, around 1905, 1911, somewhere in that range, called On Science and Democracy, I think it's called, something like this. But anyway, he describes oh, knowledge as a living uh, creature that needs replication, I... that needs practice, that needs participation from students. And he, he took us away from the rote where you study words on a board and got kids out into the field to do a nature walk to learn. Or if you're going to learn a recipe for bread, you go and make bread. You don't just rem memorize the ingredients, these sorts of things. Yeah. Anyways, uh, part of the problem with science uh, appreciation when people get older is the fact that they were taught everything as certainty and fact. And when, when you reintroduce science later in life as a conversation, as an ongoing living body of information that needs to be replicated and improved and adapt and evolve, uh, they don't understand. They say it doesn't sound like science all of a sudden. It's like, oh, well, we'll go figure it out first. Get to the end and then tell me the answer, right? Because that's what science, how science is taught in school. So it is, a, it's a teacher problem. It's a scientist communicator problem. And, uh, you know, that's why this show is, is great. But it's it's also a human problem. To always have the conversation afresh and anew. People like safety and certainty uncertainty is frightening mm -hmm. fear mm -hmm. leads to aggression fear leads yeah, to right. actions that are not open and willing to be curious and uh, and learn right and but, so instead they pay to have their name on a paper that somebody pays to have published and then the publication doesn't retract because there's no money in it I get it. It's a system of fear and cowardice and lack of ethics and standards. No, oh, it's fear and loathing in Las Vegas. That's where well, we are. Speaking of which. <laughs> oh, no, that's true. I was about to quote the movie, but was, I'm quoting the wrong movie. What the heck is the movie I'm quoting? I don't, I don't know. know what it is. I don't know. Uh, but I want to say everything is under control. control. <laughs> and mind the bats mind the gap mind the bats, bats. yeah the bats, bats. Uh, you'll find out soon enough bats everywhere <laughs> i i uh kiki is you gotta fun. go i gotta go i know well it's eric uh, Nat says he can't stay awake anymore so. through the night and into the following week but if not i if, from what the sounds of it you guys are prepared <sighs> My uncertainty meter is grid. like broken now. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going on? I don't know. Yeah. Thank you for being here. It was awesome to chat. I think, uh, I hope everyone uh, has a great week. Um, Zombie Tom, Tom Hanks, you brought up an issue that we should talk about maybe another time, which is how we deal with the, okay, well, stuff is broken, publishing, uh, you can't believe everything you see, but then does it stoke more conspiracy theories and the uh, belief that everything is fake news? Of course. And it does. But so let's think about that because I think that's important because that's not what we're aiming for, but it is part of the issue for sure. Um, so I think that was an, a very important uh, comment that you made in the chat, Mer chat there. And uh, I guess everyone... Sure. We'll Which, leave way, you with that. Not everything wait, is fake news. We I just can... got to add, though. I just got to add this little it. tidbit to that because that is a great <laughs> point. Uh, and the studies that were published showing that uh, COVID could be cured by the 
things other than the vaccine got published. <laughs> and if you look at the list of who was on that those publications, a lot of them be, uh, were part of right-wing think tanks or conservative doctors across the country who are part of a group that I can't remember the name of right now that sounds like the American... Uh, uh, yeah, there's a whole physicians, but it's got slightly different name. And yeah. they were also like pro smoking back in the fifties. Like it's this alter, there's an alter conservative organization who's also pumping out papers that are, uh, fake science. So, and they, so and they, and the they know all the communication they, rules and how to hit your emotions and how to use marketing language and framing and all the things. And so they're, it's hard. Yeah. Our information future is one of the authors of that fraught. paper also became the Surgeon General of Florida. Which they give you so okay. there's all so it's not just that we're stoking the conspiracy theories, it's that the conspiracy theories have infiltrated the asylum, which was where we lived in the asylum, where we believed in our ivory tower that ethics were holding the tower up, and now we find that the uh, the lunatics uh, are on the grass. Okay, I gotta lunatics go. Lunatics are on the grass. We all have to go. It's been a long show. Thank you, everyone who stayed, who's here. And Justin, it was great to see you. I guess I'll see you in two yeah, weeks. Is two that weeks. the way? Two weeks. Okay. I'll figure out who I'm going to be here with next week. For, I don't know. For about three or four weeks, and then it it, it, it may be every. <sighs> Oh my God! Really? Don't yeah, tease me. Like I'm. Uh, I got to do some logistical sorting out of this, but uh, the hope is don't that tease me. It would be okay. Never mind. Don't, te don't tease me. Don't See tease two me. Two weeks and then never again. <laughs> no. Well, okay. Then maybe like uh, at least every other week. We'll see. Okay. I, I can. I, I can work with that. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Stay healthy, stay well, stay curious, and stay lucky. We'll see you next week. Bye.